It was once said. One of the most exciting things about GYC is when the young people are mobilized for ministry and they're taken out into various neighborhoods, and this happens in other parts of the world, to either meet people on the street in a downtown area, to give out literature, to pray with people, to knock on doors. And they, they go out at first, they're terrified, but when they come back, they are so excited because they see God working. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. How are you doing this morning? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord, where we find love, joy, peace, and happiness in the Holy Ghost. Welcome to another wonderful, glorious week here on Lagos University Sabbath School where we have an in-depth, exhilarating study of the Word of God. We are excited to be in God's house one more time. Oh, what a glorious opportunity it is to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And around this time, especially when the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, are a little bit more attuned to the Advent season. And so we want to say happy, happy Sabbath. Jesus is the reason for the season. We are so excited that you have joined us 
whether you are on YouTube, on Facebook, or via ATV, or if you are right here in the sanctuary, we are excited that you are here with us one more week. What a glorious time to be alive. It is a cool day here in Bermuda. Yes, the wind is blowing. It is cool. <laughs> and our hearts are warmed because of the love of Jesus Christ that is flowing through our hearts. And his blood pumps through our veins. We are excited, excited, excited. It's a glorious time. Well, we have our very own Elder Josuan Smith and Dr. Shanley Birch, who will take us into our song service this morning. So lift up your voices loud, let them ring. Who's coming? Jesus is coming again. So join in as they sing praises unto our King. And I will see you right after song service. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone out there. We want to ask you to just go get the kids, get your husband, get your wife, get everyone. Come and bring them around the television if you're watching the television this morning. We're going to sing praises to God together. Hymn 330. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Mercy, I pray that that is all of our wills this morning. Amen. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love, at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king always only for my king take my lips and let them be filled with messages for thee take my silver and my gold not a mite would i withhold not a mite would i withhold take my will and make it thine it shall be no longer mine take my heart it is thine own it shall be thy royal throne it shall be thy royal throne take my love my lord i pour at thy feet its treasure store take myself and i will be ever only all for thee ever only all for thee amen what a beautiful beautiful song ever only only for thee let's sing together now hymn 302 deeper yet into the crimson flood amen in the blood 
from the cross I have been washed from sin but to be free from dross still I would enter in deeper yet deeper yet into the crimson flood deeper yet deeper yet under the precious blood day by day hour by hour blessings are sent to me but for more of his power ever my prayer shall be deeper yet deeper yet into the crimson flood oh deeper yet deeper yet under the precious blood near the christ i would live following him each day what i ask he will give so then with faith i pray deeper yet deeper yet into the crimson flood deeper yet yes deeper yet under the precious blood now i have peace sweet peace while in this world of sin but to pray i'll not cease till i am pure within hallelujah deeper yet deeper yet into the crimson flood deeper yet deeper yet under the precious blood god bless you and happy sabbath to everyone well thank you elder smith and dr birch for your ministry in song this morning deeper yet deeper yet under the crimson flood have you dug deeper are you on that deep dive into the love and the blood of jesus christ that saves us from our sin i sure do hope so because there is nothing else in this world that matters most than our relationship with jesus christ because every relationship thereafter will fall into place so folks dig deeper and what a time that we have to dig deeper into god's word and into his love than right here on lagos university sabbath school it is a time where we study god's word and we take a look at what he is saying to us the times are all around us and this lesson this lesson is an important lesson where we're going to be talking about all of the deceptions of end time events the 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 deceptions that the devil that's right the deceptions are of the devil they come to turn us away from what God is saying and he's using all manner in this time to do so but when we study and when we align ourselves with the Word of God we will not be deceived by the devil's deceptions and so if you do not want your friends and family to be deceived just like you're learning you want them to learn that I want you to do something with me. I want you to press that like, share, and subscribe button. And that way, the gospel of Jesus Christ goes around the world. 
But you can also do something. You can pick up your phone and you can give them a call and tell them to turn on ATV, get on YouTube, go on Facebook to the Hamilton SDA Church in Bermuda and they will hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So I don't want to delay much longer, but I want you to do something for me and that is to put in your prayer request. We want to be in prayer with you. We heard last week and the week before how God has been answering prayer. And we know that we serve a prayer answering God. And so we do not pray in vain. And we also want to pray with you. So send your prayer requests to intercessorsbda at gmail.com. Our prayer warriors are standing by and they are ready to pray for you and with you for the blessings and the things and, and the concerns that are on your heart. But also, send us those prayers of victory and those answered prayers because we want to rejoice with, God, with you in what God is doing in your life. And so we are ready to head right into our lesson study discussion for today. And remember, we are in Death, Dying, and the Future Hope. Today's lesson, end time deceptions, end time deceptions. And so our panel is poised and ready. Our moderator is on the wing, and we are ready to join in our lesson study discussion for this morning. And so we're going to go to our panel. Good morning, panel. Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you doing this morning? Like uh, winter, <laughs> winter came in today with a vengeance. Winter came in today with a vengeance. I'm sorry, folks. I'm, I'm just a bit cold today. I'm just a bit cold today. But my heart is still warm and glad because we are in God's house where there is always warmth and love and yes. fullness of joy. Yes. And when his word is being spoken, when his word is being sung and his word is being preached, we can almost just kind of sit by the fireplace and, mm -hmm. uh, and soak it all in and we can warm up and mm -hmm. our hearts can be made glad. So it is wonderful to see you all this morning. Well, we've got uh, quite a lesson this week. Mm -hmm. yes, End time deceptions and all of those things when we look at what, what, um, what people near death experiences, when we're looking at ancestry worship, and all of these things, when we think about end time deceptions and how the devil has, has, has put his people in place to kind of have these counterfeits that are going on when we're thinking about life in the hereafter. Mm -hmm. Tell me one thing that we're going to be learning this week mm -hmm. from, the, from, from the lesson study that is going to kind of help people who are interested and really kind of believe in these kinds of other opportunities, the universe. And, and mm -hmm. so, so we don't want to call God who he is. We want to call him the universe and things like that. So mm -hmm. share with me one thing that the people are going to learn today mm -hmm. as we go into our lesson study discussion. Um, Elder Mark looks ready. <laughs> Elder Mark is ready. Elder Mark, you go right on ahead. These, these end time deceptions are doctrines mm. of the devil. Mm. Um, and we are not to trust people's experiences. There's power in a testimony, mm -hmm. but if that testimony goes against the word of God, mm -hmm. then you're not to fall for that trap. Mm -hmm. okay. And God's people, if they're rooted in the word, they're rooted in the word, if they study the word, they're not going to be deceived by these end time deceptions, these doctrines mm -hmm. of devils. Amen, mm -hmm. amen, mm -hmm. amen. Mm -hmm. Dr. Bree? Yes, good what morning. Is something to, good morning. What is something that people are going to learn today? Because there's a lot out there. I mean, I've, I've seen it just scrolling across Swallow Facebook or YouTube, the necromancy, mm -hmm. the, you know, horoscopes and, mm -hmm. you know, 
all of these movies even of, 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 of near-death experiences and things like that. What are we going to learn that's going to help the people today to understand mm -hmm. uh, thus save the Lord in these matters? Amen. I just hope that everyone's reminded of the importance of God's word and basing anything and everything we come in contact to, comparing that with the authority of the scriptures, and that uh, our viewers take this opportunity to um, think and be mindful of what they're allowing themselves to be exposed to via media, via TV, via l literature they're reading, things like that, that um, I hope they take this opportunity to really compare that with God's word and what the Bible says about the state of the dead and just principles um, of what to spend our time doing, whatever's pure, whatever's true, whatever's lovely, whatever's just, and um, take a thoughtful reflection on that. Amen, amen, amen. Brother Brumwell, good morning to you. Good morning to you. How are you this morning? Good. Good, good, good. Yes. What are the people going to take away from our lesson study today when we think about even <clears throat> ancestry worship? Now, now, how important it is for us to, to I mean, we, we all have grandparents and great-grandparents and, and uncles and aunts and these people who are you know, really mean something to us. Um, and so we even have religions that are based on the, the respect and the honor of, of the ancestors. And, and so how important it is for us to have these things in their proper place when it comes to how we think about our, our family members who we love so dearly that have, have passed on and, and um, help, help us to understand what the people are gonna learn today. Well, one thing we learned today is that unlike the time of Saul, where you had to go to a witch in some remote place, mm. it's a new age. It is right at your fingertip. Mm. And you can conjure up your own spirit or mm. your own dead loved one, mm. wherever you are. But a lot more to get into when we get into the lesson. Amen, amen, amen. Well, folks, there you have it. I sure do hope that you are ready for today's lesson. Our moderator, in the person of Elder Howard Eben, is poised and ready to take us into our lesson study discussion on end time deceptions. And so, as Elder Howard is making his way to the podium, we are going to have our opening prayer this morning. And Elder Mark, can you offer us our opening prayer? Father God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here on this Sabbath day. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us for all our sins, all our iniquity. And we ask that you bless the word today, bless the message, that someone, someone may receive it and obey God's word. Forgive us for our sins and watch over us. Amen. 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 Enjoy the lesson study discussion for today. I'm Agent Bellamy. Did your son go missing, sir? I have him. My son died 32 years ago. That's why the green goes a million miles per hour. Frog in a blender. Daddy! Oh, honey, who is it? We believe what? The impossible. When I saw him, my body, my mind, my soul knew that this is my child. What if he's not the same? Resurrection. Series premieres Sunday, March 9th on ABC. And good morning to you, Sabbath School. Good morning to those who are online, and good morning to our Sabbath School here and our Sabbath School panel. Good morning. Good morning. Blessings to each and every one of you. Uh, today, as we share uh, the Sabbath School lesson, uh, we recognize that as we share uh, end time deceptions as our superintendent has uh, put forth to us, uh, we are also reminded that during this season there are many of us around the world that even though that we know and we have learned in this quarter the deceptions of the enemy, that we still have loved ones who have passed and are sleeping in the grave. And we look forward to the day 
uh, on resurrection morning. And so we are cognizant of the fact that many right now are going through many emotions. Right now, you, as we get close to Christmas and family occasions, remembering the birth of Jesus Christ, we become vulnerable, lonely, but we are here today uh, to share with you, though uh, the enemy uh, has sought to confuse what happens when a person dies, we want to reassure you that there is a God in heaven, and he has not forgotten your family members. Mm -hmm. He has not forgotten your tears, mm -hmm. your loneliness, your desire to see your loved one again. Even so much, uh, I want to share with you in Psalms chapter 56, the Bible says in verse 8, Thou tellest my wanderings. You put thou my tears into the bottle. Are they not in thy book? God takes your tears. He puts them in a bottle, and he knows who these tears belong to. And then he has a book of remembrance, and he has the name of all of those whose names were baptized into the Lamb's book of life. For the hour cometh that those who are in the grave will come forth. Come on now. Amen. They will come forth. Amen. Some to everlasting life. Praise the Lord. Amen. Then some to eternal condemnation. It's your fault. It's your fault if you don't make it. Not God, because I heard a song that grace comes running after me. Uh -huh. And so I want you to know today that we have this hope. We may share the deceptions. But our eyes are not on the devil. Mm. Our hope is built on nothing less. I wish I could preach right now. Mm. But I want to declare to you Jesus is coming back soon, and one day he will wipe away all tears Amen. from our eyes. Amen. We have this hope, everyone. Amen. So you've seen this commercial. You've seen this end-time deception. How Hollywood, Hollywood in so many different ways, has deceived people into believing that when you die, you go into another life, or when you die, you can come back again. That's a very dangerous deception because then people live a life of second chances. Mm -hmm. People live a life believing uh, that I can live recklessly, I can do whatever I want, drink, eat, tomorrow we die, be merry, I have another life. Mm -hmm. Culturally, we do not believe that here in Bermuda. I don't know about your culture, but right now as we share with you, as the panel shares with you, we want you to be cognizant. We want you to be cognizant of the deceptions of the enemy. Not just what Hollywood produces, mm -hmm. but what the video games produce the belief in life after death, the television shows, even the cartoons, the belief that there is life after death. I want to encourage you, do not leave your television set, your computer, your telephone. Do not leave it. God has something he wants to share with you so that you can be aware of the deceptions. Like that man on the video, as far as he was concerned, his son was dead. And then all of a sudden, years go by, and his son reappears on the scene. And there's a series that people follow on ABC that had followed. Believe him when you die, you can come back again. Panel, I don't know about you, uh, but I am ready to expose the enemy. We don't have much time. We're going to end a little early today. But we are going to expose the enemy. He's not our friend. And we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And we are called to sheer love. But when you're on the battlefield, you want to know where the attacks of the enemy are so that you can be prepared 
and others will be ready also. So panel, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm with you this Sabbath. Out of Manny Smith will be on next Sabbath. And then you have to tolerate me one more Sabbath. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But I have enjoyed myself with you. Amen. You are students of the word as I am. And when you share, we are encouraged in the sanctuary. We are encouraged online. I tell you, I had it in my heart that when I agreed that I would be with Dr. Brianna, Elder uh, Jamal Allboy with Manny Smith. Friends of mine didn't know Brianna. Elder Mark, you too, don't worry about it. But, but, but those were individuals that I wanted to be with because as I would watch online during COVID, Dr. Birch, my, my, when I watch online, I said, I want to sit around a table with them. Not here, but just sit around on a table with them. And I want you to know that as I've set this table with you, we have been blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have been blessed. Amen. So today, as we go to our, I'm so lost, we go to our first panel. And panel, who you are today, you start us off uh, with this first uh, mysticism. Certainly. Mysticism. Dr. Brianna, yes. I just heard a word from the Lord. <laughs> it must be you. <laughs> Certainly. Good morning, everyone. So this week, each day of the lesson it covers a different near-death experience phenomena or um, false belief that is out there in the world. Monday's lesson responds to the unbiblical phenomena of mysticism. The lesson defines it this way. It says, the word implies the union of the individual with the divine or absolute in some kind of spiritual experience or trance. That's how the lesson is using the word mysticism. So the problem with mysticism is that it is taken as a replacement for the authority of God's word. And thus, it, people, individuals who take part in this uh, belief system are left open to believe absolutely anything, usually then in replacement of believing the authority of God's word, they then rely on personal experience, um, subjective things that they've experienced or others have experienced, and thus have no absolutes um, and no authority or safeguard against deceptions. So why is God's word so important? We'll turn to our first text, 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So here, John makes it very clear that if we say we believe in God and we're all, we are his followers, if we even say that we love him, because some people will say, oh, they love God, but then they don't want to follow his commandments and don't want to follow the authority of the scriptures, as I was just saying. But this verse makes it clear here that if we are Christ followers, if we love him, we will be doers of his word. And that's the main point of Monday's lessons, that we are also doers. So again, why is God's word so important? It's according to David in the Psalms, it says God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Jesus said, thy word is truth through which we are sanctified. He said, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Um, and then later in John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus said to those Jews who believed, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So God's word is critical. It says his truth will set us free. His truth will sanctify us. His truth will guide us and lead us into all truth. So it's critical. The Bible warns us about appearances of religiosity, such as in mysticism, um, and warns us to test the Spirit. Some of these warnings can be found in Matthew 7, as well as in 1 John 5, 3 through 5. I'll read the one in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. And it says, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Again, the point being that some people will say, oh, I love Jesus, oh, I had this feeling of an experience with him, but then they don't follow God's word. And the scriptures make it clear that that doesn't work. That's not a um, true experience and a true follower of Jesus, because those who follow Jesus will um, do as he did, as we just read in John, and will keep his commandments. So the parable that Jesus teaches at the end of Matthew 7 sums it up very well. And we know that children's song um, that goes, the wise man built his house upon the rock, and when the rains came tumbling down, his house still stood. And Jesus summarizes it here in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So today, the main point of Monday's lesson is, are we doers of God's word or hearers only? Are we taking Jesus' advice here and incorporating his commandments, his, the, following his example with the way he lived, or being obedient? Are we being doers of God's word so that we are secure like this house on the rock? Or are we setting aside the authority of the scriptures and relying on personal feelings and friends' feelings, media, to tell us what we should believe and how we should live our lives? Which are we choosing? Amen. Amen. Eldermar? To add to what Dr. Thornton had mentioned, she, she spoke about relying on feelings, on your personal experiences. The first time mysticism was discovered, or it happened, was in the Garden of Eden, mm. in Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> and the woman saw that the food was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes. That it was what, church? Pleasant. Pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. And she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave unto her husband with her, and he did eat. She relied on her experience. She went beyond the protection of God. Her feelings, her experience, mysticism, combination of emotional and spiritual feelings. Mm -hmm. I think this is the way God is leading me, instead of what God is saying in the word. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. My mind. Yep. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Both of you, very good points. Mm -hmm. And Elder Mark has a bachelor's in theology, and I believe right there mm -hmm. he put that sermon right in and, and mm -hmm. shared that. That's, that's an excellent point. He, he said, you didn't say my name you wanted to sit with on, on the panel, and so let me, let me show you that God can bless my mind. Amen? Amen. I, I, I received that, but that's, yeah. that's a good point because everything has an origin. Everything has an origin. And I, I like if I can share also this quote, even though both of you have shared it in the way that you present it, I like how when we read the spirit of prophecy, Sister White sometimes seems like that she is outdated. That, okay, you said that in the 1800s, but it's kind of old. Were you really a prophet? And she says, the position that it is of no consequence what man believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows the truth, that the truth received in the love of it sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, and another gospel. That may just seem like a simple quote, but not when we live in a postmodern era where people say, don't judge me. I can do whatever I want. It, it doesn't make a difference what we believe, as long as we have love. Hmm. Let's just love one another. Uh, um, and so when we share, uh, Sister White was in tune, but that's, we have to be so careful in what we say, but we also, as our our superintendent brought out that some see God as the universe. And so when you're talking with someone and you say God is good, who, who are they talking about? Are they talking about the God you believe or are they talking about the God that they believe? Out of Mark, we are going to go on 
uh, to near-death experiences. And I remember when my father passed away. My, before he had passed, he had had a heart attack. He had to have a double bypass, then a triple bypass. And this was, he was on the operating table, and he, we prayed, and he came through it. And we give God praise. Well, then, Dad, my sister and I were talking with him home one afternoon, one evening, and he said, I went to the other life. We're Seventh-day Adventists. We don't believe in that. My sister looked at me. He was like, Dad, what do you mean you went to the other life? He said, I saw the light. I saw the light. I went to the other life. My sister and I said, Dad, on the operating table, they have all these lights around. Before you close your eyes, that's what you saw, Dad. Man, he smiled. He grinned. Praise the Lord, he died a believer. Come on now. Amen. There are so many theories out there, so many deceptions that if we take time with the word of God, we won't be deceived. Out of our near-death experiences. One of the most deceptive phenomenas, phenomenas is what we have called near-death experiences. It's a, the short term for that is NDEs, near-death experiences. Many people use these near-death experiences as evidence or proof of the immortal soul. In the book, Life After Life, The Investigation, Survival of the Bodily Death, Raymond Moody, he did a five-year study of 100-plus people. And these people were clinically dead by the hospital standards. They were clinically dead and we were, we were revived. And they claim to have seen a loving and warm being of light, a tunnel of light, before coming back to life. Um, I remember I had a relative that was going through some uh, brain surgery. And um, I said to them, if you see a bright light, don't go towards it. <laughs> because I wanted my <laughs> I took... <laughs> praise God, I, I know much more. Yes. <laughs> And over the years, there have been similar books that have been published about the near-death experiences. The Bible is clear. In Psalm chapter 146, verses 3 to 4, put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth, he returneth to the earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. The Bible is clear. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. The Old Testament and the New Testament, they continually tell us that the dead are dead and give the resurrection account. In all of these resurrections in which Christ had resurrected people, no one ever mentioned a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. um, there was some research done in the Scientific American, a well-known magazine, and it was talking about NDEs, near-death experience. And they discovered that many of these NDEs were positive or they were negative. But the thing is, most people don't share the negative ones. They only share the positive ones the ones that you see on TV are all positive. Um, thus, they attach this to the divine, but no one attaches the other one, the, the negative ones. Um, these NDEs, these near-death experiences can be frightening, marked by terror, loneliness, anguish, and despair. Even the, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, people are having these NDEs. On YouTube, they're sharing these experiences um, that they're talking to dead loved ones. Their loved ones are floating in the air. Some of the, them are watching their selves on the operating table. Previously, no one knew when an NDE was going to happen or when it was recorded. But apparently, in February, just this year, there was the first recorded brain activity during, during death, and it happened by accident. Researchers, neurologists, they were, they were 
analyzing the brain activity of someone that had epilepsy. The person with epilepsy died, and researchers had measured 900 seconds of brain activity at the time of death. And they began to investigate 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after the time of death. Neurosurgeon by the name of Armour Zemmer, he said in a press conference, there were brain, brain wave patterns on a, on a stopped heart in an area of high cognitive function. In other words, this brain wave patterns was found in the area where there is high cognitive function, where dreaming takes place, where memory recall and meditation take place. Here's, the, here's what they concluded. This study actually supported um, the dead know nothing. Mm. Why is there brain activity in the brain if you're dead, if the body's dead? And if your spirit is going somewhere, why is there brain activity my, my. when you're dead? My, my. <laughs> and they realized that the study was showing that these NDEs that people were discovering, um, they were dreaming. They, they were, these NDEs, whether positive or negative, they were exposing the hopes and fears. If you're a Christian, then you're probably going to think of something positive. If you're not a Christian, you're going to be thinking, you're probably going to have a negative experience. I had another relative that had a brain tumor, and he said that um, he, he was in a, angels were, he was on his way to heaven, and angels were throwing stones at him. He did do a back of nonsense. <laughs> He said angels were throwing stones at him, and he was dodging, and he was dodging, and um, maybe if one of them hit him, he would have lo you know, lost his life. But he, to get, to get back on topic, um, clinically dead by the hospital standards doesn't mean really dead. For example, Lazarus was dead for four days, and he stunk. You know, his body was rotten, and God raised him up. Clinically dead does not mean really dead, and another the conclusion they came to that it's either psychochemical hallucinations under extreme conditions, because there's brain activity going on in the brain, mm -hmm. and or there's a satanic deceptive experience, because some people are talking about that they spoke to dead people, they spoke to their dead relatives. It could be a combination, the conclusion was it could be a combination of both. Mm -hmm. Satan could be in, at play, and also they are experiencing hallucinations in the brain. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, the Bible alone, we need to know the scriptures for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Psalms chapter 119, verse 105 says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. God's word is able to help us determine what is truth mm -hmm. and what is error. Stick to God's word. Do not depend on other people's experiences if their testimony does not line up with the Bible, mm -hmm. then do not take their testimony mm -hmm. into account. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, that was very thorough. Mm -hmm. uh, we appreciate how you took your time with that elder and uh, the thought that there are spirits that leave the body. And those spirits are to have thoughts and to communicate but yet the body was still having thoughts. Mm -hmm. It doesn't line up with the deception. And, and this is the sweet thing about the word of God, everyone, that where the devil has a deception, he got it and twisted the truth. Yes. In other words, there can't be any deception unless the there's first truth. Mm -hmm. are, are you with me out there? Mm -hmm. And so the devil has twisted the truth, and, and we want you to now take the word of God, sanctify them with thy truth. Mm -hmm. Thy word is truth. Amen. No matter what Hollywood shows that would depict people have gone to heaven, depict people living in the afterlife, we ourselves... We can get caught up watching these shows on a Sabbath afternoon on Netflix, and we say, well, you know, it's got a little Jesus in it. Well, a little Jesus tainted with deception and sin. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's not the road we want to be on, because then we're saying 
it's all right that we can, con we can uh, share that, no, it's not so much as you can believe anything. Mm -hmm. You must stick with the truth. Amen. While it's not so much that you can watch anything. Amen. Come on now. Amen. You can't just watch it. And so easily we can watch anything. So easily at Christmas time we could buy our children toys. Hey, my wife and I, we brought our son a whole pile of toys when he was a little one. My daughter would get a whole pile of toys. And one, one day, we had, evening, we had worship. We put our son to bed. And then all of a sudden, we hear about 20 minutes later, Daddy, Daddy, come. We come into the room, and he says, Daddy, something was pulling my sheets. Something was pulling my pajamas. Come on, now. And we looked, and we talked with him, and he explained to us as a little one, what was going on? And the Holy Spirit says, look around you. You brought the enemy into the bedroom. Mm. We had Spider-Man and all the other gargoyles and everything, all in the room. Mm. Toys that we said, oh, these are nice little toys for Justin to play with. But what we had, listen, listen, listen. I know that, that the falls here, I'm going to hit you. I know there's falls <laughs> here that people put hexes on falls here. Yes, they do. <laughs> I know everyone's going to take the hurl out today. But, but people put hexes on falls here. And they put hexes on toys. Demons caught up in toys. Demons caught up in Xbox and the games. I'm, I'm going, listen, people, you've got to be aware. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I must, I, I got to, you know, beauty parlors must make the money. I'm talking about people that are doing foolishness, caught up in Satanism, and they are doing things. But we're bringing it to your attention. And enemy, I am so glad that we are exposing you. We are so glad we are exposing you. Now we're moving on. And I want to thank the Lord for the, for the visual aid. I want to thank the Lord for the visual aid. They're doing a good job. Can you give them a hearty amen, everyone? Amen. Now I, I've, I've taken so much of my time. We are in reincarnation. Elder. We are in reincarnation. We are in reincarnation. And so we're going to give the elder his 15 seconds. <laughs> then we're going to reincarnation. Elder, bless yes, you, man. Yes, yes. Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's so much in this lesson that we, we could spend a whole afternoon, but I won't do that. And you touched on the toys situation and all that. And uh, you'll recall, like, back in the, the 80s, a very, very popular game was the Ouija board. Yes. And when I looked it up, it says, this, this is the description, how they lay it out. It says, and we're talking about mysticism and, and mythology and all that stuff, right? It says, enter the world of the mysterious and mystifying with the Ouija board. You've got questions, and the spirit world has answers. And... Believe it or not, it starts, or says the age appropriateness for this game starts at the age of eight. So to your point where you're talking about your son and bringing the toys into the room and all of these things were occurring, when we are exposed ourselves or even our children to this stuff at a very young age, we are indeed exposing them to the devil. Sure. And this is the way that, like Elder Mark had mentioned about that mysticism started in the garden. Indeed, it did. You know, with, with the pleasing of the eyes, and she saw that it was good for food. It's by our sight that we take this stuff in. And we have to be very careful what we are expose ourselves to because the devil is in the details. And we don't want to take that chance of drawing or even in, 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 in exposing our children to the things that are of the devil. So we have to be very careful. They clearly state what it is. It says, you've got questions, and the spirit world has answers. And my it's mind. not talking about the Holy Spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. My, 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 my. Good point. Good point. Reincarnation. Reincarnation. I'm going to look at what is shared from the Sabbath school lesson. If you look down at your Sabbath school lesson, uh, those of you in your living room and here, as you look down in the Sabbath school lesson, Tuesday, December the 2nd, 6, the pagan notion 
of an immortal soul. The pagan notion of an immortal soul provides the foundation for the unbiblical theory of reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. Transmigration of the soul is the teaching that when you die, you go through every creature on the earth. Every creature, you just transmigrate, transmigrate into every creature, and once you go through every creature, then you go through a stage of enlightenment. That's a Hindu, uh, Far Eastern uh, 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 teaching. This theory has been adopted by some major world religions. Mm -hmm. Emphasis there, major world religions. While most Christians believe in the existence of an immortal soul, so because of the teachings of the church, the false teachings of Babylon, the false teachings of the... <laughs> While most Christians believe in the existence of an immortal soul that abides in a permanent heaven or hell after death, those who believe in reincarnation hold that such an immortal soul goes through many cycles of death and rebirth here on earth. For some, reincarnation is the thought to be a process of spiritual evolution that allows the spirit to attain ever greater levels of knowledge and morality in its journey towards heaven. Hindus believe that the eternal soul goes through a progress of consciousness of samsasa, sam, samsara in six classes of life, aquatic, etc. But I like how Hebrews says it. Hebrews says, as it is as appointed unto man once to die, Hebrews 9, verse 27, and is appointed unto man once to die. It's in the Sabbath school lesson, but after this, the judgment. It says even Christ himself in verse 28, 28, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. How many times was Christ to bear the sins of many? Once. That means he died once. The living know that they shall die, but the dead know not, not anything. anything. So when we look at this subject of reincarnation, I like how, the, and I'm sticking this time to the lesson because I like the points that were brought out. It says, as you scroll down or look at your page, it says, this theory contradicts the biblical teaching of mortality of the soul and the resurrection of the body. Mm -hmm. It contradicts it. And we must stick with the word of God. The Bible says that we come up out of the grave. That means before we come up, we must have been down and we stay in the grave. And the Bible says that those who are resurrected, they are resurrected and every eye will see the voice that resurrected them. Amen. So if you go from one life to another and nobody knows, come on now. Mm -hmm. Second, it negates the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in the redemptive work of Christ. We are saved by grace. You cannot say, as I go through my reincarnation, as I go through karma, seeking to be at Nirvana, the highest enlightenment, that if I have good karma and bad karma, if I do good in this life, when I get to the next life, I'll probably be a prince because I've done good things in this life. No, 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 no. We, we there is nothing in us that, is good. that could afford us salvation Amen. or a better life. For how many people try to do good and still end up suffering? Mm -hmm. Come on now, or say, I wish I had more money. Mm -hmm. Buy that BMW, come on. We, we do good because it is Christ in us, Amen. working in us the will and to do of his good pleasure. We can't help but show love to people. You cannot earn salvation, and you cannot go from one life to another life expecting something great because of your former life. No, we are saved by grace. grace. That's why I love when, when, we, we, when, when we encounter people that have, like Dr. Brianna, I can say, hey, Bri, how you doing? And she's like, I remind everything cool, you know. Why? Because a title is not important. My name is Howard Edmund. I don't care what you call me. That's what my mom and daddy gave me. Howard, Dudley Howard, and I ain't telling you the rest. But listen, <laughs> third, the theory contradicts the biblical teaching that one's eternal destiny is decided forever by one's decisions in life. No, it's not. 
Fourth, this theory downplays the meaning of the relevance of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Listen, the devil is so deceptive. Look at the screen here. Look at the screen and look on television. Thank you very much for putting it on the screen on television. Look on the screen. We see this reincarnation theory where a person is born, they go through the process of aging, and as they age and they get old, unless they get hit by a bus or they die from some, some illness, they reach the point of death, and then you see on the screen, then they live again, and they start growing into the next period of life. Or they can come back like a horse, a donkey, a mule, a spider. I know my brother-in-law, when he was doing ministry, and uh, my sister brother-in-law, and I was there in Sri Lanka preaching to Buddhists and Hindus, and, and because of the Hindu teaching, believing in transmigration, the life after death, uh, 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 a cow would go across the street and the Seventh-day Adventist church there uh, that, that he was the treasurer at that time, he would buy cows and he would give to the, the, the people in, in the village and they considered him to be like a god and he had to let them know, no, I'm not a god. Why? Because the cow was sacred. That was somebody's life and it produced milk and, 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 and was able to help the village. And so we, and, and then the theory is, don't kick that dog because that's Uncle Joe. No, that's not Uncle Joe. Uncle Joe is in the grave. I'm sorry, but it's the evangelistic spirit that's coming out of me. I, I, I need you to understand that the devil is very deceptive. So deceptive that he takes the word of God. John chapter 3, when Nicodemus encountered Jesus, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Those new age, new ages who believe that when you die, you go into another life. Take this biblical text and says, Jesus said, you must be born again. No, Jesus goes on in the text and says, you must be born of water and spirit, meaning transformation. You can't take that text and use that. No, that's a deception. Devil, you have been exposed. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Look at your Bible. Look at it. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do man say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, verse 14, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, Elijah, and others Jeremiah, so one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And impressed by the Spirit of God, Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mm -hmm. It is so true that the Jews believed in the supernatural. They found, and that's because they were influenced by pagan culture, mm -hmm. Tammuz. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 8 that they weeped for Tammuz, Tammuz who had died, Semiramis' his son, who was the wife of Nimrod, who was the sun god. Go look it up. And so that culture, even during the time when Jesus was walking on water, they said, is it a ghost? Jesus wanted to clear it up. And he says, but who do man say that I am? You say that I am Elijah. Some say that you are Elijah. Some say that you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so reincarnation is saying, see, Jesus must be Jeremiah or Elijah, reincarnate. And Jesus used this text to say, but who do you say I am? Because you can't push the church of the living God forward if you don't know that I am the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. What is your conviction? What will you share with the world? And we can go on as you see the text on the screen. These prophets prepared the way of the Lord. John the Baptist prepared the way of the Lord. He was not a reincarnate of Elijah or Jeremiah or any of the other prophets. Each prophet prepared the presence of Jesus. So devil, you're exposed again. You cannot take biblical texts and try to suit them for your doctrinal teaching. It is impossible because the word of God will always be truthful. But we have to be reminded, saints, we have to be reminded that in the last days, 
there will be apostles that will come forth and they will share that they have gone from one life to another. And that leads us now into Brother Bremwell. Where are we? Wednesday. Wednesday, necromancy and ancestor worship. The lesson today talks about necromancy and ancestor worship. I like the, the opening passage on Wednesday. It says that the word necromancy derives from the Greek term necros, dead. <coughs> Manatea, divination, practiced since ancient times. Necromancy is a form of summon of summoning the alleged active spirits of the dead in order to obtain knowledge, often about future events. Ancestor worship, meanwhile, is a custom of venerating dead ancestors because they are still considered family and these spirits can, and these spirits can, it is believed, influence the affairs of the living. The pagan practices can be, these pagan practices can be very attractive to those who believe in an immortal soul or also those who miss their deceased loved ones. The lesson is built on, on the passage from 1 Samuel 28, 3 to 25. What is happening in the passage here? It shows that in the course of time, the prophet Samuel had died. Saul, while in his pursuit of David, had left his kingdom unguarded. The Philistines, taking advantage of Saul's neglect, had now penetrated deep into the middle, into the heart of his kingdom. While Saul was away, the Philistines came in. Just missing something here, one second. Yeah. So the text I have here says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. But why? Because there comes a time that if we continue to reject the bidding of the Holy Spirit, he will leave you to your own reprobate mind. And this was the case with Saul. He was heading into a battle after he sought after the Lord, and he sought after the Lord. But the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, by Urim, or by prophets. One might ask the question, why did God forsake Saul? But really, it wasn't God who had forsaken Saul. Mm -hmm. It was Saul who forsook God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. While Samuel was alive, Saul had rejected his counsel. Saul has, had also exiled David. Saul had also slain the priest of God. Mm -hmm. Could he now expect to, to be answered by God when he had cut off all means and channels of hearing or reaching God? Saul wanted the salvation of God, but did not want God to be his Lord. Mama. Hmm. Had Saul humbled himself and come to God in penitence, in contrition, God would have heard him, and Saul would not have needed to go to the witch of Endor. But Saul didn't want pardon for sin, nor did he want reconciliation with God. Instead, he only wanted deliverance from his foes. God, I don't want anything from you. Just help me with this matter right now. I don't want you to be Lord. Just save me right now. That is what Saul wanted. 
And, because, and for that reason, God would not hear him. If Saul had just humbled himself, come to God in humility, repented of his sins that he had, he had done, God would have heard him. But now in desperation, the proud king needing to hear a word from God or from the man of God thought the only way he could hear from Samuel was by having someone conjure up Samuel from the dead. And hence he went and he sought out who in the land could bring me up, Samuel. My, 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 my. my. Saul knew very well that God did not approve of the practice of necromancy. God had said previously in Leviticus 19.31, do not turn to mediums or spirits. He also said in Leviticus 20 verse 27, no man, no a man or a woman who is a medium or a spiritist shall surely be put to death. It was also Saul, as we see in 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. He was the one who removed all of these people from the land. Saul knew better. But it shows here that when you have wandered away from God, when, 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 you, when you get up and you, you backslide, and you stop coming to church, you stop paying attention to God, and you think you can do this one sin, and you have control over it, Sin, that one sin will cost you more than you plan to spend. Mercy. And you think you have control over it, but not so. And that one sin will keep you longer than you intended to stay. And this was the case with Saul. He continued to push away God, push him away, push him away, until the time when he wanted to hear him, God could not be found. Again, I say, seek the Lord while he may be found. Mm -hmm. Call on him while he's near. Mm -hmm. The witch also reminded Saul of what he had done. Said, you, Saul, were the one who put us away. So why do you not come tempting me? Or do, do, do you want the king Saul to kill me? Saul assured her and said, listen, it's fine. Your life will be spared. Now, a lot of people use this passage in a bid to prove that the dead lives and also know the future. But note these two salient points in the very same passage. As the witch conjures up the spirit, Saul does not see Samuel. But instead he asks the witch, what do you see? What is its form? It is then that Saul perceives it thinks it is Samuel, but he did not see Samuel come up out of the grave in bodily form. He only thought it was him. Then the second point I want you to bear in mind is that Saul perceives, as Saul perceives Samuel telling him how tomorrow you will die and join, you and your sons will join me over on this side. It is perpetuating a lie, which is to say that the dead are, when they die, they don't really die but they are over there in some other form. And this is contrary to the Bible. So if you're reading the text, you will understand that you can't take this literal. Because it, if, you, if you take it, it would contradict the Bible. Amen. Yeah. So this is why the Bible says in Isaiah 8, 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to it, it's because there's no light in them. This spirit which came up as it spoke, there was no light in it. It was contradicting the Bible. And these spirits, when they come to you, they will contradict the Bible, letting you think that the dead are really, are, are really not dead. But if you know the Bible, you cannot be deceived. Amen. Friends, the devil doesn't know the future. Only God knows the future. Good point. The devil is smart. He knows he's been around for a long time. God tells him, what he's able to do. And by reasonable deduction, the devil can, with some level of accuracy, predict the future. But he doesn't know the future. Only God knows the future. My time is up. So the question is, 
as I wrap, let me just cut some things out as I see time is running out. How do we secure ourselves from all of these things which are likely to deceive us? We must put on the armor of God. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 8, 19 and 20 says, And when they say to you, Seek those who are mediums and wizards, and who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they not seek the dead? Should they seek the dead of, on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, mm -hmm. if they speak not according to it, it's because there is no light in them. How will, how will we be, be, be saved in this last time? Study to show yourself approved. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth so shall true. set you free. Amen. We Amen. have to read his word. We have to believe his word. And we have to be obedient to his word. Amen. Amen. Presented very nicely. We, we, we heard it. And, and, and my good brother, all panel members and all Sabbath school and those who present publicly, the word of God is rich. We will never exhaust. <laughs> We will never exhaust. And it's not our role, Brother Bramrao, to exhaust everything, but to awaken understanding and clarity. And then we ourselves continue the study as we grow. This is why the elder is at the mic, because he's been doing his Sabbath school lesson. Amen? And so, elder, love you, man. Yes, yes. I love you too, brother. <laughs> like you said, this, this is not to... Uh to shame or finger point or any of that, but simply to enlighten and show people, bring to light uh, the world of darkness, yeah? So, one, one and, and I've been guilty myself, so I'll be the first one to say guilty as charged. One of my, you know, former time, favorite movies was Star Wars. I watched all the episodes. I knew all the characters. I knew everything when it came to that. But the necromancy that was even in that, you know, persons who have died and now Luke Skywalker is communicating with his mentor, Yoda, and, and some of the others, and the telepathy that was in it, the spiritualism is all in that. But even more recent times, again, guilty as charged, trying to be a positive role model to my son, right, and empowering him as, you know, black man and the power of being black and proud to be black. black Panther. We, my wife, well, more so I, but she, she came along with the ride. We just decided to, to go see Black Panther. She now, came I, with you. She, she was just, with me. She just, you just, she, okay. she, you know, she, she was accompanying me. Okay, I see. And now, I didn't know anything about Black Panther. I didn't read the comics of Marvel and all. <clears throat> I didn't know anything about Black Panther. So I was sitting there and watching this movie un unveil itself, and as it got to a part of it, he went into sort of like this, I guess, this trance or whatever, and, and, he, and then the next scene you see he's standing before this tree, and all these panthers are all up in the tree, and the next thing that happens, the shapeshifter thing occurs, and now he's talking to his father where the panther turns into a, his father and he's communicating with his father. And I was like, oh boy, I really messed this one up. <laughs> you know, and, and on, the, on the way home, we're having now to explain to our, our son <laughs> what actually occurred. And I felt so horrible because I know I was responsible for exposing him to that. And we had to explain what necromancy is all about and all of that. And, if you didn't know, the Black Panther is the king of the dead. N uh, I'm sorry, it's Necropolis. As you just said, Necro is, is dead, and Opolis is a city or a state. So he is the king of the, the state, the state of the dead, right? And he, he communicates with, 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 with the dead. But also, I was looking at it uh, yesterday, there was this comic, um, and it says, let me just read it real quickly. It says, honored fathers, mighty warriors, fearsome prince, black panthers all, in the name of Bess, I call upon you to counsel. Obviously, I didn't know who Bess was, so thanks to Google, I looked it up. Bess was 
uh, Egyptian uh, goddess. So his calling on the spirit, this goddess, and her figurehead was that of a cat. Black Panther is a cat. His praying to the goddess uh, of the dead. And so these are the things that we have to, yes, I'm for black power, I'm proud to be black. But when it comes to being spiritual, we have to be very careful of what we expose ourselves to unknowingly. Because mm -hmm. we could do detriment to, to, to our children by doing this. And like I said, we had to explain what, what happened. Yes, so sir. I just want to highlight, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Yes. Amen. Even big eyes. Big eyes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. It's important. You brought it out. You took us into Hollywood. Thank you very much. Aldemar. There's this lesson. Uh, personations and other appearances. It's amazing, church. It's like there's nothing to watch on TV anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I can't even get comfortable watching anything because mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable watching anything because it's just filled with all this nonsense. And I'm, as I'm studying this, I'm like, mercy. But anyway, the elder Brumwell, he mentioned Necromancy. Necromancy. Necromancy was summoning the dead. I'm talking about, in this lesson, personation. And that's actually impersonating the dead or other demonic appearances. Um, personation is defined as primarily as a legal term, meaning to assume the identity of another person with the intent to deceive. Form personations of the dead and other demonic appearances, for example, is a form of deceased family members, friends, or anyone that's dead, and they have been visited by someone that is the devil that has impersonated their loved ones. The physical appearance and the voice may be similar to the deceased. It is used to deceive those who are not firmly grounded in the word of God. The first impersonation, impersonation ever recorded is found in the Bible in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. The devil had impress, impersonated the serpent and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit from the trees in the garden, but God said, you must not eat from the truth eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Mm -hmm. And this is the basis of all this end time deceptions that we face today. Satan is practicing the same tricks on us. Mm -hmm. And he likes it when we portray him as a red beast with pointy horns coming out of his head pointy ears, a pitchfork, and a widow's peak. Satan wants the world to view him like this so that when he comes as an angel of light, we are deceived. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 to 15 says, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, verse 15. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their deeds, according to their works. My mind. Matthew 24, 5 says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 4, talking about Satan, who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself to be that he is God. Ellen G. White says in the Great Controversy, page 624, and the crowning, as the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will impersonate Christ. Mm -hmm. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18. Brother Brumwell, he spoke about the armor of Christ. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God is stronger than Satan, church. Amen. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wise of the devils. Because of Christ, we are stronger in Christ because greater is he that is in you that is in the world. The third way we can withstand the demons, withstand the demonic deceptions is for we wrestle. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. Verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day having done all to stand. Lesson four, we must engage in battle. We must do something. The battle is not only fought for you, but it's fought over you. And you have to take a stand. You cannot be complacent. There's books, there's dirty magazines, there's movies are entrances to bring in demonic oppression. Demonic oppression. We must take a stand. Verse 14. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. The word of God overcomes temptations. Not our feelings, not our experiences, not people's testimonies if it goes against the word of God. Mm-hmm. Presonations sway you from God's word. Don't let your own works try to save you and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of of peace. Knowledge of God will overcome deception. The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Faith in Jesus Christ overcomes Satan's deceptions. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Number eight. Assurances of God's salvation will overcome deception. Know who you are and whose you are. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer, beloved, overcomes deception. Mm -hmm. Let us be prayer warriors. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, satanic personations and appearances can be frightening and deceiving, but they cannot mislead those who are grounded on God's word. Mm -hmm. No matter how strong these personations may be, someone, the dead, someone impersonating the dead, saying, I love you, I miss you, saying things that they are in a better place, no matter how strong those personations, we must always stand firm on the teaching that the dead are in the grave (coughs) asleep. And if anyone is dealing with demonic possession, demonic op- oppression, stress, and, or struggling, you can call us at the Logos University at the Hamilton Seventy Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is what, church? Yeah. And the love is real. We will pray for you and we will walk with you. You can find us at intercessorbda at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 We are coming to the end of our Sabbath school. And our panel and those who have come to the mic have sought to reveal truth, to expose a lie. And we pray that you have found hope, clarity, understanding because of different experiences from all around the world, even here in Bermuda. We have uh, people who operate businesses where you can speak to the dead, seances, and palm reading. Here in this island, we are not immune to it. I want to share with you in closing before our music comes to us. I remember when I was in Zimbabwe, in Bulawayo, we were doing three weeks of evangelism, preaching the word of God, and we were staying at a lodge, and the receptionist at the lodge had come to me. and She had shared that she had learned through the teachings of the word what happens when you die mm-hmm. and that there is a resurrection. Amen. And she was sharing this with me because her father, who participated heavily, participated heavily in the teachings of witch doctrine, 
who was very much a rich doctor. And June was coming, Jul June, July, and her and her sister were required to participate in ancestor worship, calling forth the dead sister, the demon. But once she heard the truth, she didn't want to participate in that ritual anymore. Mm -hmm. And she asked if I would talk to her father, the witch doctor. The elder took me at night to the father's house, the witch doctor. Culture follows you. We believe in, in demons and spirits. And we sat down with the dead. We sat down with the father and we explained to him what happens when you die. Talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and Jesus coming in the clouds of glory with thousands upon thousands of holy angels. And he will shout and raise the dead. And we shared with him that his two daughters did not want to participate in this ritual. Mm -hmm. The house was like a hut. We were talking, and the father listened. Friends of mine, I didn't know what was going on in his mind. All I could do was reveal the truth. Mm -hmm. And then the father, with all the light that was shared, God came into the midst of that experience, and the mm -hmm. father said, they don't have to participate. Mm -hmm. Amen. They can come to where you're preaching. Amen. On the Friday, that was the Thursday, an off night. On the Friday, the young sister who was sick, she came to the meetings that evening with her sister. Mm -hmm. We preached about the woman caught in adultery and the grace that God had given. And at the end of the meeting, driving down in the car, she was like, oh, pastor, oh, pastor, God's grace. Come on now, saints, God's grace. He's a good God. He died for me, God's grace, and tears coming down her eyes. The truth had been revealed. And I was listening to her, and I was like, God, I want what she wants. I want that type of experience, that first love, that excitement about God's grace. Amen. Here it is now, that Sabbath evening. We are closing the series. We've preached our last message. We go back to the lodge. Half an hour later, I hear a whole pile of celebration in the reception area of the lodge. I ask the question, what's going on? <laughs> the witch doctor showed up at the meeting. Come on now. Amen. The witch Amen. doctor showed up at the last night of the meeting, surrendered his heart to the Lord, Amen. and wanted to see his daughter in the resurrection. Amen. Amen. Listen, saints. God has a promise. He is coming back again. You don't have to participate in these rituals. You need guidance. You need hope. God's word will see you through. Amen. As my Amen. son Justin comes and he, see, and he plays his song, I love you, Jesus, more than anything. That was her heart. And we pray it's your heart. We pray it's your heart. The love of Christ brings us into a relationship that brings hope. Amen. Looking forward to his return. Amen. Justin?
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. We invite the person who is assigned to do our close in prayer. Pray for us as we close the Sabbath school. Bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. Your word is truth. We ask that you sanctify us, sanctify us by your truth. Please guide us as we go into the worship service. Guide all of our viewers online, those in their homes, those watching on TV. Please fill them each with your spirit and lead them into truth. Encourage them to continue studying your word. Um, inspire them and give them motivation to continue learning more and the willingness for us all to submit to your truth and to surrender to you as we continue learning and growing in you. Please bless us this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name, amen. It was once said. One of the most exciting things about GYC is when the young people are mobilized for ministry and they're taken out into various neighborhoods, and this happens in other parts of the world, to either meet people on the street in a downtown area, to give out literature, to pray with people, to knock on doors. And they, they go out at first, they're terrified, but when they come back, they are so excited because they see God working. What GYC provides is a framework an opportunity like no other opportunity that exists right now, where young people can come and be part of something where the Spirit of God will descend and set them on fire. And they can go away with a renewed vision and a renewed commitment and a determination and an understanding that God is big enough, big enough even to use them, big enough even to change their lives. They could come to GYC and find a vision for what their future could be like. Good morning, Hamilton Church family, and happy Sabbath. Let's give attention to our announcements for the upcoming week and the remainder of the month. In our family news, as we go to our prayer closets this week, let's remember all of our church family whose names are in the bulletin. Let's especially remember Sister Hyacinth Lightborn and family on the loss of her husband, Brother Erwin Lightborn. This afternoon at 4 p.m., the Sabbath School Afterglow program will continue. Our presenter today will be Elder Alan Fox, and we will be going over the Sabbath School lesson for this week. Let's now look at what's happening next week. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., our deacons will continue their weekly Bible study here in the boardroom. The conference children's ministry end of year celebration is being held tomorrow, the 11th of December in the center from 2 p.m. until 6 p.m. 
all children aged 5 to 12 are invited to participate. There will be food, fun, crafts, and so much more. For more information, leader at your church. Our leader here at Hamilton is Sister Velvet Scott. The Happy Seniors Club are having their Christmas luncheon next week Tuesday, the 13th of December at 12 noon at the Guato Bay Hotel. All seniors are invited to attend. The ABC will be holding a 20% off sale on Wednesday, December the 14th. They'll be opening at 9 a.m. and closing at 6.15 p.m. Come on down to the Adventist Bookstore and ABC Natural Foods to purchase some of your holiday needs. Wednesday brings us to our community service feeding program, which starts at 4 p.m. and lasts for one hour. Please take note, the feeding program will be closed for the holidays from December 26th and reopening again on January 23. As we approach the holiday season, the Community Service Department is looking to continue helping those in need in our community. They would like to provide grocery vouchers again this year and are asking members to assist by purchasing gift cards from either the Lindo's Market or from the Marketplace. The distribution date will be next week, Wednesday, December the 14th. Let's go and purchase these cards to assist others during this season, which can be difficult. Marva Trot, our community service leader, if you have any questions or to give your gift cards. Let's look at December. Our community service team will be providing Christmas dinner for those in need on Christmas Day, Sunday, December the 25th. This will be held in the Youth Center from 1 p.m. until 3 p.m. Family, they can't do it alone and need our help on the day to package and service the meals. Anytime you can give will be wonderful. It's a wonderful experience and friends and let's give back to our fellow Bermudians. As they do each year, the Bermuda Conference will hold the annual year-end service here at the Hamilton Church on Saturday, December the 31st at 5 p.m. The service will be followed by refreshments in the seat as it usually fills up quickly as all churches are invited to attend. Now that the church business is out of the way, let's look to celebrating our members, starting with the birthdays. And we have three persons celebrating a Sabbath birthday today. They are Joy Joel, Edward Tucker, and Carliza Lightborn. Happy Sabbath birthday to each of you. Have a wonderfully blessed birthday. Celebrating on Monday, Adesha Keynes, Bernetta Philadelphia, and Judith Wolf. On Wednesday, we have Jalay Allboy, Chevelle Birch. On Thursday, Alcia Chase, Albert Smith, Joelle Robinson, and Stephen Simons will celebrate. And closing out the week on Friday are Tyanika Baisden and Gerald Burns. Family, let's put these dates in our calendars and we prayer this week as they celebrate their special day. Celebrating an anniversary next week. Celebrating their anniversary on Monday are Michael and Lillette Weirs. Then on Friday, we have Desiric and Joy Allen. Happy anniversary to these couples Enjoy your special day. Our bulletin this week has Psalms 2714 for us to remember. For those who are having a difficult time or are waiting on the Lord to fulfill a promise, they it says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. 
This can be a very difficult thing to do when we are in the midst of our stuff. We may feel that God has forgotten us and we want to give up. Let's not do that. Let's hold on to the scripture and wait on the Lord. Okay, church family, those were our announcements for today. Remember to take your bulletins home, govern yourselves accordingly, and everyone enjoy your Sabbath and have a wonderful week. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Good, morning, Good, morning, Sabbath. Good to see you on this Sabbath morning. We are here on the top side of the earth, Amen. and that's a wonderful thing. Amen. Amen. Let us stand for the call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from Luke chapter 4, reading verses 16 through 20. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 20, reading the New King James Version. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was under the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has set me sent me to heal the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. I pray this morning that our eyes will be fixed on Jesus as his word is proclaimed to us today. together. Spirit of the living God, what a privilege it is to be here in the house, a house that is dedicated in your honor, that's here to uplift your holy and precious name. Yes. Oh, God, it's windy on the outside, but I, rem I remember the story of in the upper room, where when the Holy Spirit fell, they heard the sound of a mighty rushing wind. Yes. God, I ask that you would come and tabernacle in this place. Fill this room with your presence, that the name of Jesus and him magnified and glorified may be uplifted in this place. For it's in his precious name we pray. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, amen, amen. For the Lord is good and his mercy is
O come, all ye faithful. Hymn number 132. this morning to prepare our hearts for prayer I thought about something came to mind that I guess we all might be able or most of us relate to during this season is that a lot of people bring in packages and I'm sure you like me have tried to call FedEx or DHL and you always dial that number and hope that someone answers on the other end that sounds like you. It's never the case. Inevitably, someone very far away answers the call, but you know that your package is sitting somewhere in Pembroke, Mills Creek or St. John's Road, but yet you're speaking to someone on the other side of the world, asking them, how quickly will you be able to get that blessing that's sitting in Pembroke? They don't give you much more information than what you've already looked up online. They can't give you a time or even someone else to talk to that might be able to help you get what you know you're anticipating. But I came this morning to let you know that we have a direct line to someone who has the answer for every query that you have, for every conundrum that you may find yourself within. 
and that he told us to call on me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things which you do not know. We serve a God who is waiting, who has begged us to reach out to him, not for us to solve these matters on our own, but to go to him who has the solution and the need for everything that we may encounter. I invite each of you this morning as I pray on behalf of us and those that may not be here this morning, I beseech you to make your petitions known to your Heavenly Father. He is waiting and looking forward to bestow upon you the things that you cannot understand. And as the praise team prepares our heart this morning, let us put our hearts and minds in a frame of meditation, of supplication to our Father in heaven. and gracious eternal heavenly father this morning we come with thanksgiving in our hearts that you woke us up to see another day maybe chilly outside and breezy but you've placed a warmth within our heart that doesn't come from the temporal matters of this world that try to bring us down or to steer us away from you you've given us the assurance that you have our every need provided for, that you have our deepest concerns at the forefront of what you're able to provide for us. Father, it's that thanksgiving that we come knowing and with the assurance that if we ask, you will answer. Father, we know that in this season, this holiday season, this Christmas season, that it is a time of both joy in recognizing you sending your son to, to this earth, this cold, crude earth. But it's also a time of reflection and for some, a time that may not be as joyful because they may not have a loved one with them through this season that they may have experienced before. Father, we'd ask that you go by and comfort all those that may be mourning right now. We'd ask that you would give them the assurance that one day soon, that we have the opportunity to be reunited with our loved ones in the earth made new when you come back. Father, help us to be mindful and help us to be ready. Help us to encourage those that we come in contact with 
to also be ready and that our hearts might be made right in you. Father, although we tarry on this earth, there are things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis, basis, whether or not they're relationships, whether or not they're financial needs, whether or not they're sicknesses. We know that we deal with things every day that in a lot of instances we may try to find earthly solutions for. Father, we'd ask that you would, we would first come to you, that you might give us the rest in you, that, that you are the provider of all things. Father, help us to not be so self-sufficient and self-sustaining. Help us to focus on you as the giver of all things. Help us to not be so selfish in our thinking. Help us to be mindful of those that we come in contact with as well on a day-to-day basis. Help us to share your love with those that we come in contact with. Father, and through the course of this service today, we would ask that you would speak to our hearts. Speak to our hearts through the music, through, speak to our hearts through the message that will be preached by Pastor Steve today, that it will fall on fertile hearts, that our minds and hearts might be receptive to a word from you directly to us. We each have things that we struggle with, but you are the solution for all. And we'd ask that we help us to rely on you in those things. Father, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Help it not to be out of form or fashion that we gather together or even profess to be Christian, but help it to be who we are and manifested in our hearts and spirits, we pray. Father, help us as we go through this service that we will be reflective on you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church family. It's good to be home. Good to be home. I mean, this Christmas time, we often uh, sing Christmas carols as we hail the birth of Jesus. But even in this time, the birth of Jesus and his life and his death and his resurrection gives us a blessed assurance. And as I was thinking about what to sing this evening, I, I prayed and I asked God, I said, I don't know what to do. Um, And last night, um, I woke up multiple times with this song just playing on my mind. It's probably because my mom had mentioned my grandmother yesterday. And this is one of the songs that we sang together that I videotaped. But it's the blessed assurance that we have. We are heirs of salvation. We're purchased by God. We're born of His Spirit and we're washed in His blood. And it's because of this that we can truly, truly have freedom, that we can truly, truly live life and live it more abundantly. So I pray that you'll be blessed as a consequence of this song. Mm -hmm. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Foretaste of glory divine, heir of 
salvation purchased of God born of his spirit washed in his blood this is my story this is my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, they bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Oh, this is my story. This is my song, praising my
Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he indeed is good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Sharma. Thank you. Good morning, saints. Good morning to each and every one of you. Those of you that are online, good morning. A special good morning to you. A shout out to my family at this time that we worship God in the good and the bad times. So remembering my family in prayer at this time, please. Thank you. The word of God lovingly reminds us to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy in all instances. Hebrews 4.1.10 speaks of finding rest, and it states, Christ is our Sabbath. We are also told that the seventh-day Sabbath is a special gift, and it's for us. A precious gift, a weekly day of rest and restoration, the day when we draw close to the one who we who hallowed it, a day when we connect with our family and our friends and strengthen the godly sense of our community. I would like to welcome our visitors at this time. I know that we do have some in our midst this morning. Please do stand. Please do stand. Good morning. Good morning to you. Can you please tell us your name and where it is that you're visiting from? Amen. Well, we welcome you. We thank you. And may your experience be rich with us today. The Lord has a special blessing just for you. May you receive it. Thank you. On Sabbath, the work is never done, but we are invited to set it apart for the moment to dwell in the presence of God, to experience its sacredness. Welcome to this day of rest here at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, where worship is a joy and the love is real. Rest in the Lord today, for he is the Lord of the Sabbath, and I pray that you will all be blessed today. Pastor Steed. Can the church say amen? Come on, somebody ought to say amen this morning. Huh? Somebody ought to say praise the Lord. How many of you are blessed by that rendition from Dr. Williams? Can you say amen again? God using our dear brother. Good to have him back home. Good to have him in this place. I want to welcome you to the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church where worship is a joy and the love is real. There are a couple of things. I want to invite, uh, we have a clerk. We also have our treasurer that will be coming in our direction this morning. But I just, before we get going, I uh, want uh, to first acknowledge just a few birthdays, a few Sabbath birthdays. We have Sister Joy Joe. Can the church say amen? Uh, Sister Carliza Lightborn. Can the church say amen? And our very own brother, Edward Tucker, is celebrating a Sabbath birthday today. Want to wish all three of them, yeah, put your hands together. Want to wish them all a very happy Sabbath birthday. Before they come, I just want uh, to testify about the goodness of Jesus Christ. Uh, because a couple of weeks ago, I left here on a long journey. Took 11 flights to get back home. Uh, and, and the truth of the matter is, uh, if you're wondering if God still lives, just understand uh, he will keep you no matter where you are. I <laughs> uh, left here uh, last week or two weeks ago, flew from here to New York, and he kept me. <laughs> flew from New York to Istanbul, Turkey, and he kept me. <laughs> flew from Istanbul, Turkey to Tel Aviv, <laughs> Israel, <laughs> and he kept me. Now, I must admit, the rabbis were trying to meet with me, Elder Birch. They were trying to meet with me over there. I had to let them know that my time had not yet come. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, I left Tel Aviv. We flew from Tel Aviv to Amman, Jordan. Went from Amman, Jordan, huh, to Cairo, Egypt. Oh, man, we left Cairo, Egypt, and flew back to Istanbul, Turkey. We flew from Istanbul, Turkey, back to New York from New York to Dallas, from Dallas to Huntsville, from Huntsville to Atlanta, and Thursday I got back here in Bermuda, 
and his angels kept me for 11 flights. And all I can say is God is still good and he's still watching over his children. I got to admit, you know, in the first few flights, you know, your prayers are fervent. Lord, keep us as we go up. When you get to about flight number five or six, you're like, Lord, just do whatever you want to do. You know what I'm saying? It gets, it gets just redundant. And after a while, the plane starts taking off and you're already asleep. You don't know when it goes up and you don't know when it comes down. But even while you're sleeping, he's watching over you. Uh, even when you're not paying attention, God is there for you. And so I'm just thankful even though in Turkey they tried to stop me. They tried to stop me telling me I couldn't travel uh, on my Bermuda passport. They tried to give me that line. I had to let them know, man, you must be confusing me with another country uh, because uh, I, I'm not moving. I stood there. I waited till they looked up the list and realized that Bermuda was on a list that we could just travel. And it was amazing because to fix it so I could get on the plane, they had to call to corporate office to change the computer system to allow me to get on. But I stood there, man. I stood there, and in my head, I said, hail to Bermuda. <laughs> uh, in my head, I said, God save our gracious king, because there's no way uh, that I'm moving <laughs> until they let me on this plane. But it was an incredible experience, and I look forward to the many sermons ahead. Uh, so many things come alive to you over there. So many things uh, that you only could imagine before. And now it was right in your face. Uh, and I don't know, uh, if you guys are planning on going over there, I would just let you know, uh, if you were wondering, Jesus was a very fit man. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, he was super fit, okay? Because all them hills and mountains, you got to climb over and over and over. I'm telling you right now, he was in excellent physical condition. Uh, I'm telling you right now, but more importantly, he climbed all those mountains for you and for me. Uh, he always had his eye on his disciples. Even I remember we were there on that first day we were on the Sea of Galilee and then we went up to the high mountains uh, where he often would come to pray. And it's amazing because even though you're way up in the sky, you can see everything that's going on on the Sea of Galilee. And I need you to understand, although Jesus is in heaven right now, there's nothing down here that he doesn't see. There's no situation that you're in he's not paying attention to. His eye is on the sparrow. So you ought to know that he's watching over you. What a blessed time we had. My wife and I together, we had a great time over there. And I'll, you know, I'll just let it come out in sermons. You know what I'm saying? I know some of you want to sit down and talk and reason together. And we can do that, but I'd just rather let it come out in sermons. Because when you think about all the good things that Jesus went through, and all the suffering he went through for you and for me, oh man, you ought to come to church every Sabbath rejoicing and praising God because he did it. And he did it without a car, without a bike, without a bus. He walked. He walked. He walked, man. He walked. Everywhere he walked just to save you and just to save me. So I praise God for his mercy, for his traveling mercies, and for his grace. Uh, to us and that contingent we had and it was absolute joy because because of the fact that there were several other if you would Adventists that were in Israel at the same time our group was a group of 52 uh, but but Adventist World Radio at the same time had a group of 153 and so you run into different mountains and people recognizing you and they recognize us because our whole trip we wore, because we were youth department, we wore our Pathfinder uh, yellow, you know, sash or whatever, or whatever they called it, the scarf. We wore the scarf. And, and the truth of the matter is, they were picking us out from everywhere. Even when we were in the Jordan doing baptisms, an Hispanic delegation, the pastor ran over because he was from... I want to say it was Puerto Rico, and he was running over to give us hugs and to do baptisms with us uh, because he recognized that scarf and recognized that there were other adventures. It was just a joy to be there from mountain to mountain to mountain to mountain. <laughs> Everything's a mountain. Uh, I tell you, man, everything is a mountain. And to think, to think, not only did he climb those mountains, but just even thinking about that mountain, they call him on the precipice, whatever, where they dragged him up there to throw him off. <laughs> they went to throw him off. It's a long walk from the temple to that top of that mountain. And he went the whole distance just to pass through them. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, they thought they had him, man. They about to toss him over, and he just passed through them, uh, came through them, and they couldn't do nothing about it because his time had not yet come. We serve a mighty God. And one thing I learned about that trip is that he's in full control. <laughs> There's nothing he's not in control of, and I just pray that the way I was blessed, I'll be able to share that blessing in sermon after sermon as we learn that new dynamic of Jesus Christ. Listen, we got some transfers, and then we're going to ask our treasurer to come forward. He has some, he has a promotion, I believe. Come on up at this time. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Happy Sabbath. We have two final readings for transfer of membership today, and they are for Andrea Rattery and Tenille Rattery, who are transferring from the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church to the Restoration Ministries Adventist Church in Southampton. Amen. Indeed, we are deeply saddened by uh, Tenille, uh, if you would, and Andrea leaving us, uh, but we wish them nothing but love as we look into that camera right there at the back. I want you to know how much we love you, man, how much we miss you in this place, and that this will always be a home for you. Uh, we welcome you back with open arms anytime you decide to come and visit us. That motion has been uh, made. Is there a second? It's been second. All right, all in favor say aye. All opposed, the same sign. Uh, may they go in peace. At this time, uh, Elder Enzabalin. Yes. Two weeks ago, we started an initiative uh, to raise funds to help us replace our new audio sound system. And we all agreed that um, really a functioning uh, sound system enhances our worship experience. I mean, you, you have seen from time to time glitches that happen uh, around here. And then people hear, hey, turn on, turn on the mic, turn on the mic. So you can see that, again, having a functioning system, it does help. And so we have as an objective to raise 20,000. Um, I understand that will really help to re uh, give us a new, a new system. And so what we asked is just to make pledges. They are, uh, we have uh, some uh, cards here, and the ushers have uh, some of these cards. What we ask is that you select an amount that you want to pledge. You don't have to put your name. We're not asking you to put your name, but just circle the amount and then return the, um, the card either to the ushers or put it in the tithe and offering um, that we will collect it that way. So far, we have had uh, 3,800 pledges and 300 came in. So what we ask you is at the time of making that payment, that's when we want your name. And also make sure that you mark as the audio sound system so we can segregate those funds so that it can be used towards that initiative. So thank you very much and um, be blessed. Amen, amen. Can the church say amen? Come on, why don't you stand with me at this time? Let us stand together. Let's get our service back going here. Come on, let's stand. Come on, let's get up out of your, come on, on your feet, on your feet. Get up out of your seats. Repeat after me this morning, there's no place. Uh, Come on, I can't hear you. There's no place like this place, anywhere near this place. So this must be the place. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Look your neighbor in the eyes. Put a big smile on. Come on, look him in the eyes. Look him in the eyes and say, neighbor, let me see your biggest smile. Come on now. You're in the right place. Come on, tell your neighbor, shake their hand. If you're okay hugging them, give them a hug. Tell them it's good to be here in the house of the Lord. We sing an amazing song, a song that touches our heart, a song that's beautiful, a song that's lovely. It's a good day. It's a good day. Let us worship the Lord in spirit and in truth.
Good morning, everyone. So now that we have sufficiently stuffed ourselves last month in Thanksgiving celebrations, and you're preparing to warm up for Christmas, let's talk about digestion. <laughs> um, I know, right? The digestive system is a group of organs that work together to break down the food you eat into the actual nutrients that your body needs. So let's have an overview of the digestive process. And you may or may not remember from school, but I know our younger, our younger family can help us out with this review. So when you eat, chewing begins to break down starchy foods into carbohydrates with the help of saliva. Food then gets pushed down the esophagus to the stomach. The muscles at the top of the stomach relax to allow the food to enter. And then after the food goes into the stomach, the muscles at the bottom of the stomach begin to move and acids break down the proteins. Eventually, the contents of the stomach are emptied into the small intestine. The pancreas, liver, and gallbladder add enzymes to help to further break down the food. Then the walls of the small intestine absorb the nutrients into the bloodstream and into the cells in your body. Waste, or whatever is undigested, is pushed down to the large intestine. The large intestine absorbs the water and remaining nutrients, then eventually pushes it out as waste. Sounds easy, right? Piece of cake? Well, as you might imagine, Digestion is a very complex process that requires the proper functioning of a lot of organs to work properly. Um, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, amen? So I will go over a few tips to optimize your digestive health. 
especially in this season. Number one, eat both insoluble and soluble fiber. Insoluble fiber, also known as roughage, promotes bowel movements. Those are important. Whole grains and vegetables are a good source of insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber can help prevent your stools from being too watery. And you can get soluble fiber from things like oats and legumes. Number two, incorporate probiotics and prebiotics into your diet. Probiotics, like yogurt, have the same kind of healthy bacteria that your digestive system needs to function properly. Probiotics can en enhance nutrient absorption and even strengthen your immune system. Prebiotics, such as raw fruits and whole grains, can act as food for the probiotics and help to support the healthy bacteria that's normally in your gut. Number three, stay hydrated to have softer stools that pass more easily. Need I say more? No. No? Okay. Number four, smoking, caffeine, and alcohol can interfere with digestion and lead to problems like stomach ulcers and heartburn. Stay away from those things. Number five, regular exercise helps keep foods moving throughout your digestive system and prevent constipation. We want to prevent constipation. And number six, too much stress or anxiety can actually wreak havoc on your digestive system. Have you ever been so worried about something that your stomach hurt or you felt nauseous? So look for ways to avoid stress and manage it properly. So in summary, please try to incorporate at least a few of these tips to have better, better digestive health as we head further into these holiday festivities ahead of us. Remember 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you? Let's keep our temples working properly to the glory of God.
Jobs and Happy Sabbath. Today, remember the Lord's Day. Every perfect gift is from God. James 1, verse 17. Morning church and happy Sabbath. Today, my verse is every perfect gift is from God. James 1 verse 17. Good morning, boys and girls. There it is. It seems like this morning everyone's talking about health. We had digestion. We were talking about climbing hills and mountains. Everyone's talking about health this morning. So why not talk about exercise? Um, do you know what exercise is? Come tell me what exercise is. Exercise is when you run and ride a bike. One more person. Exercise is when you're doing something that is very active. Yes, very good. Exercise is doing anything that actually helps to make your body healthy. So movement helps to make your body healthy. Do you do exercise throughout the week? Does anyone exercise throughout the week? We exercise in gym. Yes, you exercise in gym. I exercise by riding my bike. I exercise while I'm playing. Yes, you exercise when you're playing. One more. I exercise, I exercise by playing with my friends. Yes, you do. That's very good. Let me show you something in my bag. Let me see if you guys can identify what it is. Does anybody know what this is? Let's see someone that hasn't said anything yet. A weight? Yes, this is a weight. Can you guys see the number on this weight? Yes, five pounds. I'm going to pack it back in my bag. Because you actually don't need this just yet. But adults do need that. They need that to help them grow strong and healthy and to stay strong and to keep them strong as they get older. What are some things that, what are some of your favorite exercises? My favorite exercise is riding my bike. Okay, well, my favorite exercise is running, kind of, a little bit. Maybe a little less than a little bit. But I do like weights. I enjoy weight training. Um, so let's stand up, guys. Can you take your arms to the side and circle them around like that? Can everybody do that? Yes. Can you circle them the other way? Yes, can you raise them up and down? Can you march really slow? Can you march fast? Can you march slower? Can you bring your arms up like that? Yes, can you march slow? Really slow. So older people might do a slow march like this. And some older people even do a fast march. Let me see your fast march. Yes, and then some younger people do slow marching or slow running, and some people do a faster one. Let me see a faster one. Very good, very good. All right, you guys can sit back down. So there's a Bible verse from 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, which says, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So you have a job to do. When you get home, tell your parents that they should try and exercise at least three times per week. How many times per week should your parents exercise? Can you say that really loud so your parents can hear you? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I think they got the point. Three times per week. And you guys exercise daily in gym and you run everywhere, right? If you have to go and do a chore, your mom tells you to do a chore, and you just run and go and do it, right? Yeah, or yes, you run around, so you're always exercising. 
So that's what we want to do. We just want to remember again, so whether you eat or drink, can you guys repeat after me? So whether you eat or drink, whether you eat or, drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31. Who wants to close out in prayer for us? Okay, come on. Dear Heavenly Father, wait. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Keep us safe here tomorrow. Help, me, help us to have a good day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And help us to remind our parents what? times per week. Thank you, everybody. You can go back to your seats. church so this this week I I tried to you know I tried to start early to think of what I'm going to bring um, to the to the church this week and uh, Sabbath afternoon came after church service oh, let me let me let me start let me think deeply about this let me pray over this nothing <laughs> Sunday nothing <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, praying, thinking about it, nothing, absolutely nothing. And sometimes when you have to get up here, it can be, you know, a lot of pressure. You know, you don't want to get up here and have nothing to say. I just, nothing was coming. Or you think of something and it's like, nah, that's not good enough. Um, and somewhere this morning, <laughs> it occurred to me like a flash that it was already there before I even left service last Sabbath. Because I, I realized, wait a minute now, I already had the message from Elder Astwood's sermon on, on faith, where I left with a very strong impression as to how that message affected me and how it hit me. And that is clearly something that I could and should share and testify to today. So, and I think what I took from his message last week was about faith, but not just faith, but about the perspective that faith should bring. What do I mean by that? Well, I thought about, and as his, his message was delivered, <clears throat> I thought about how it, it, it impacted my feelings and my thoughts about a project that I was involved in. And this project is a, a very deep and involving project, very complex, very expensive project. And it was just behind schedule. And nothing I could do could keep this thing on schedule. It just fell further and further and further behind. At this point, I think it's about a year behind schedule. A situation where you just throw your hands up in the air. The budget just blown up. Nothing's going right. And as I would kind of go through all these negative thoughts and feelings about it, why is it going this way? Why isn't this thing working out? And it occurred to me somewhere along the way during Elder Astwood's sermon, why? Because when I thought about it, God knows me, and he knows that I'm going to be uh, very type A OCD about these things, and I want it to work perfectly, and I want it to work on time, and I want it to be just like that. If it had gone that way, we would have been in trouble. Because when I look at the cost overruns, had the project gone on time, we would have been way over our heads. So God used the slowdowns in the process to allow us to keep up. But I never saw it that way. 
The whole time I saw it as a negative thing. My perspective was wrong. So having faith and sufficient faith in what God is doing for you and leaving it in his hands allows you to have the correct perspective, to look at things the right way. You can look at this in your own situation in your own life. When you get that bonus or you get that raise, what is the first thing that happens? The fridge dies. The washing machine goes out. The car, you know, the car falls apart. Always something. But how do we look at it? What is the perspective that we bring to that situation? Should our perspective be that, man, I got this money finally and it's gone? Or should your perspective be God provided the way out before the problem occurred? It's about perspective. And so we really need to continually remind ourselves about how God leads us through these situations by leaving things in his hands. And I thought about Psalm 103, where it said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. What did it say? Forget not all his benefits who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things. This is the God that we serve. He'll take care of all these things. We just need to relax. Let him take care of it. And so as we prepare uh, to, to return our tithes and our free will offering, Let's remember that. Let's remember to have a correct perspective in all things. Now, as the deacons and the deaconesses come to collect uh, this morning's offering, uh, the North American Division offering will benefit Adventist Community Services, which is a very, very important function. And uh, also, for those who have filled out the yellow pledge cards, please remember to place the yellow pledge cards into the offering plate. Let us pray. Dear Lord and our Savior, we thank you, dear Lord, for your benefits, your many, many benefits, be it financial, be it health and strength, whatever it may be. Help us, dear Lord, to have the right perspective and help us, dear Lord, to continually lean on you with faith and understanding that you have all things under control. In your name we pray, amen. Try. 
Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Proverbs chapter 31, verses 25 through 31. Proverbs 31, 25 through 31. And it reads, Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. Let us meditate upon God's word this morning. We may not know the month, the day, or the hour, but thank God that Jesus was born. He was born in Bethlehem. Amen. And we are just so grateful. We're here to sing some songs, some familiar hymns and carols. Feel free to sing along with us as we give God praise, glory, and honor because he is worthy of it.
Church of the Living God, say amen. We say amen for our praise team and our musicians. Put your hands together for them. Appreciate their hard work, all the things that they do for us to enhance our worship experience. Can the church say amen? Come on, why don't you pray with me at this time? Spirit of the Living God, in the wee hours of this morning, you and I had a conversation about this moment. Speak now, Lord, for thy servant is listening. In Jesus' name, let the redeemed of the Lord say amen. amen. Come on, somebody say amen again. Amen. Uh, I lift up before you verse 7, verse 7 of the second chapter 
this Old Testament book we call uh, Ruth. Verse 7 of the second chapter. And here's what the word of the Lord says. And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and hath continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. <laughs> that she tarried a little in the house. I have entitled this providential, hmm. this imminent, this transcendent pericope, one hard working woman one hard working woman. I think it's important as we jump into today's word to first remind us for indeed this particular series has been stretched out. Uh, it's important for us to realize that this particular book is written during the time of the judges, the time when Israel was continuously apostatizing. The time when God would correct them and they would come back to him only to leave him all over again. And this particular chapter, this uh, great chapter of the book of Ruth, portrays, if you would, an incredibly hard working woman. I wonder today, is there anybody here that grew up in a household with a hard-working woman. Uh, come on now, say amen. amen. Come on now. How many of you have, if you would, right now, in your house right now, your wife or perhaps somebody or a daughter, whatever it might be, that's a hard-working woman? Huh? Uh, if you believe that you have a hard-working woman in your house, come on, stand up and put your hands together for her right now, man. Come on, put your hands together for the hard-working women in this house, man. Come on now, you can do better than that. Put your hands together for them, gentlemen. Huh? They work hard. They work hard. What a blessing, what a blessing. You know, you know it's, 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 it's amazing because, it's amazing because in Bermuda, as it is in some other countries, it's just almost impossible most times for the man to be the only one that's working. Uh, because our country is the most expensive country in the world, it demands that we have, if you would, a wife that's willing to work. That's just, that's just reality. And the truth of the matter is, is that many of you know that whether it's your mother or your wife or whatever it might be, she, don't just work, she didn't just work hard at the job. She came home and had to work and do another job just keeping the house just cooking and cleaning and doing everything you could imagine. And then she had a third job. She had to raise your kids. Lord Jesus, man. Huh? Some of them had the fourth job because they also had to raise you. Oh, Lord, help us, man. Lord, help us. I, I, mean, I mean, the truth of the matter is uh, we ought to thank God for the hard-working women here at Hamilton Church. Can the church say amen? Uh, it's amazing because even I remember when we were building this church, it was those same hard-working women that would be here every Sunday morning. Now, we had work rallies back then. We'd be here from Sunday morning to Sunday evening. Matter of fact, it was during that time I learned how to shovel sand correctly. <laughs> correctly. I knew how to shovel sand, but I learned how to shovel it correctly. Brother Adam Morris Francis taught me how to shovel correctly. This is the ground. Now, okay, it was down here, right down here uh, by the in touch office. And, and we were just, we were ground level at that time. And I'll never forget, we had to fill up the mixer to make some cement. And I was, I was shoveling the sand, and I was walking it over to the mixer. <laughs> and I was, I was putting it in. I'd go back and get another shot. Out of France, said, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, man. You got to learn how to throw that sand, man. You know what I'm saying? You got to stand up 10, 15 feet back, man, that long shovel. Pick it up, and you got to throw it. And make sure it all lands in the mixer, you know? But it's truth. It's, the truth of the matter is, is that during those times, uh, 
The ladies would be here and they made us breakfast. Come on now, huh? Being the center making us breakfast, they made us lunch, huh? And there weren't no ordinary food, it was good food. <laughs> they made us good food. You know, it's interesting, my good friend, Elder Richard, told me he, he's, he's responsible this, next, this upcoming holiday. He's responsible for making the cassava pie. That's what I was told. That's what I was told this morning. He's responsible for cassava pie and fruit cake and all this kind of stuff. I had to go to the back and have a meeting with Marvin to make sure these things were true. Uh, it's, it's absolutely unreal. But we are looking forward to this festive season. And in this moment, we find here, we find here an, an incredible story. Because Ruth, if you would, is seeking now to go and glean, if you would, in a foreign land. Hmm. Now understand, we talked about this before, but understand that the law had it in place that you had to leave the corners of the harvest for the poor. Now there were three people that were distinguished in that number. There was the widows, there was the orphans, listen to me, and the foreigners or as scripture called them, the aliens, okay? The foreigners were to be taken care of. Now it's interesting because if you would, Ruth fits two of those. She's a widow and she's also a foreigner. But understand this, it's for those same two reasons that oftentimes people of her, if you would, persuasion, people of her standing, would oftentimes be rejected because she was a woman huh? and because she was a widow. In other words, the perception was she has no protection. Who's going to do something if we do something to her? And so oftentimes, even if the women found grace and were able to go out there and work, oftentimes the men in the field would tamper with them while they were working. And so in essence, it's very important, if you would, uh, that Ruth finds, if you would, a person who will give her grace and protect her at the same time. Uh, it's an amazing thing because Ruth comes and the Bible, if you would, if you would join me in chapter 2, the Bible says, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was what, everybody? His name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn uh, after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers, verse 3, and her hap, listen to me now, put that up on the screen, verse 3, and her hap was in light on the, come on now, and her hap, now I need you to understand what the scripture is talking about here. Samuel is actually portraying this story as if everything is just happening by happenstance. That it's just by chance it happened. Now, we don't believe in luck, but that's in essence what, if you would, Samuel is pushing on us here, that it was just her luck. But understand, this is not the first time he's used these words. He's actually saying something to awaken your senses that it's anything but luck. In other words, if you would, ah, oh, how could I When they had, if you would, lived through the death of Elimelech, and his two sons, Marlon and Kilion, one who was physically ill, the other one was sick in the head. And, and after they had lived through all of that, and they are dead, now what happens is, is that God sends a famine into the land. But when it's described in here, it says it just happened to be a famine. Huh? Hold on now. Then it says later on that they just happened to hear that there was bread in Bethlehem. Oh, Lord, help us. Hold on now. After that, it just so happens that when they show up to Bethlehem, harvest time had just begun. 
Whoa, hold on a second now. And now, now, it just so happens that the field that Ruth pulls up on is a near kinsman of Naomi. What Samuel is trying to let us know is that when it comes to divine providence, nothing happens by chance. I need somebody in here to understand that once you were on the curb, once you were on Court Street, but now you're in the church. Once you were a devil, and now you are a deacon. Once, if you would, you were an egotistical maniac. Now they made you an elder of the church. It didn't happen by chance. It was the hand of God while you were in this house today. It's an amazing thing because if you would, Samuel says, she just happens to show up to this field. And here's the thing about Ruth. Ruth comes to work hard. But I need you to grasp this concept a little deeper. Because two things need to happen in order for divine will to be carried out. Number one, she must find a man who's in charge of the field who's going to be kind to her. <sighs> Secondly, she must, listen to me good, she must find somebody that's a near kinsman. <laughs> Hold on. Don't, don't, listen, I'm, I'm going to take you there right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and take you there because some of you are going to miss this. Understand this. I can honestly say I, I, I've been to the field of Boaz. Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. Uh, uh, da, 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 I, I've been there. And, and I need you to understand. Uh, I'm telling you, when I saw it, I went crazy because I'm in roof right now. I, I lost my mind when I saw it. Everybody else was calm on the bus. I was losing my mind because uh, I need you to understand uh, that right next door in the same area is, if you would, the cave where shepherds were watching their flocks by night. Oh, you're going to catch it in just a second. I, I, I need you to grasp this concept because in essence, if you would, Ruth is over here and she must find a man that is a near kinsman. She needs a kinsman redeemer, but she also needs somebody that's going to be gracious to her at the beginning of the harvest. Well, well, what's the, what's the big deal about the shepherds? Well, it's an amazing thing. So many things get cleared up because one of the things, in my mind at least, the imagery of a shepherd keeping his sheep to me was always this kind of fenced-in thing where they came in, but that's not the case. In actuality, they would put the sheep in a cave. The sheep go in a cave. And then a good shepherd lays in front of the cave all night long to protect all the sheep that are in the cave from, if you would, any wild animals or any thief that tries to show up. So you say, preacher, what's your, what's your point? I'm getting there. I'm getting, I got a few minutes. I'm getting there. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. In this moment, you have to understand that in essence, Jesus is the bread of heaven. Hold on a second now. Hold on a second now. Jesus is the bread in heaven. And all heaven is concerned about is making sure that his lineage comes through the house of David and comes through Bethlehem. Hold on. Which means the reason why Jesus even tells them that there's bread in Bethlehem without any repentance is because he's working on a divine plan which supersedes the human plan. Mm. All before this, every time Israel messed up, they would not receive any blessings until they repented. But God needs to make sure that the lineage is done. You know scripture says that he's the root and the offspring of David. He's David's child while he's also David's creator. He's his son of David, but at the same time, he created David when David was in his mother's womb. This is the God that we serve. But it's an amazing thing because the shepherds, the shepherds, understand this, would lay in front of this cave. Now understand this. I need you to understand something about shepherds and the respect that if you would, Hebrews have for them, which is pretty much nothing when it comes to their testimony. Hold on. Understand this. Shepherds are not allowed to give testimonies in court. <laughs> they are considered the most untrustworthy witness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know why? Because a shepherd spends his entire existence just trying to find grass, for the sheep to eat, which means 
They can never find them. They never know where they are. They're always just wandering somewhere to the next piece of land so that the sheep can have something to eat. For this reason, their testimony is never called upon because you can't even rely on them to show up to court because you can never find them. Hold on, though. But 2,000 years ago, the angel found the shepherds. Hold on now. Found the shepherds watching their flocks. Hold on now. And finds them right next to Moab, come on now, not next to Moab, right next to Boaz's field. Uh, and he finds them watching uh, their, their sheep by night. Hold on now. And he gives them, he gives the untrustworthy the message to tell the world. Uh, hold on. And the message is, is that there is bread in Bethlehem. Oh, Lord, help us. That there's a baby lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. There's a baby that has come to redeem the world. And here's what's amazing. Here's what's amazing. The same place where Ruth started her harvest, the same place where Ruth started to glean, it's the same place where Jesus was born and he started to glean and he started to harvest and now he's calling upon this church to rise up because it's harvest time. The king of kings is coming. He's coming to take us home. But guess what? You got to be a participant in the harvest. Oh, he said, my house, the song says, my house is filled, but my fields are empty. He wants to know who will go and work for him today. Huh? It seems like, he says, the song says, my children want to stay around the table. Only few want to go out there and work for him today. It's an amazing moment because, if you would, the untrustworthy shepherds get the message out that there's a baby, there's bread in Bethlehem. It's an amazing moment because, if you would, Ruth rose up, and here's what I love about this text, is that, if you would, our key text today is actually answering a question. Come on, pull it up for me. I don't know who's upstairs, but pull up for me, if you would, verse 4. Verse 4 of chapter 2 in Ruth. If you can, uh, Ruth chapter 2 and verse 4. Uh, if you can put that on the screen for us, if that's possible. Uh, Ruth chapter 2 and uh, verse 4. Let's read what the Bible says. I don't see it up there, so I'm going to go ahead and just pull it up myself. Here's what 4 says. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, The Lord be with you. And the reapers answered him back, the Lord bless thee. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, whose damsel is this? Oh, Lord help us. I need you to understand that if you would, the Lord of the harvest recognized immediately this hardworking woman. Oh, I need the ladies here to understand that the Lord recognizes a hardworking woman. And I want to challenge the men here today to understand that you have a fiduciary responsibility, especially when you have a wife that's hardworking, to lighten her burdens. Oh, Lord, help us. What, what am I talking about? I'm saying to you uh, that in essence, you can't expect her to go work all day just like you're working all day, and then when she comes home, just cater to you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I know, I know I'm offensive people. I, 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 I never really cared. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I, I, I need you to understand. I need you to understand that your responsibility is to lighten their burdens. <sighs> Lord Jesus, I, I need to help somebody here. I need you to understand that you are called to be a servant leader. Yes, you are the head of the home. We're not disputing that. But your job is to practice servant leadership, which means when she needs help, you're in there helping. Oh, Jesus. Sometimes you got to help wash the dishes. Sometimes you got to send her to bed and you do the dishes yourself. Sometimes you need to cook dinner. Lord Jesus, man. Sometimes you need to vacuum the house. Sometimes you need to help the kids with their homework. 
Lord, help us, man. So, look, I'm trying to help somebody here today. I, I, I need you to understand, uh, you can't expect her to go work all day and then work all night uh, and then hope that you can have some fun later on. She's wore out. You're all fresh because you have done nothing. It's okay, it's okay. It's all right. I'm, I'm going to help you out. I, I, I need you to grasp this concept because it's very, very, very important that you understand uh, that in essence you are abdicating your responsibility when you do not operate as a servant leader in your house. Your job is to serve. You're just like the police, the ambulance, the fire, whatever the world is. You are to serve and to protect. When you do that, then she wants to follow you and she'll do anything for you. When all you can do is come home and be mad because your food is not on the table, then you got a problem. Because you ought to understand that if she puts your food on the table every single day for you, if you actually have a wife that does that, and she didn't get it done today, whew, that ought to be a signal to you that, man, she must have been working really, really hard today if she couldn't get my food on the table. Let me get up and go cook dinner tonight so my wife can rest. Yeah. It's okay, it's okay. Or, if you can't cook, let me go order. You know, I mean, I mean, let me call Sagasso. You can, you can pick up a phone, can't you? Huh? Can't you pick up a phone? And say, hey, four stop, uh, four, uh, 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 hey, <laughs> call somebody and get them to deliver something. Go pick something up to, to, just to show to your wife that I love you, I care about you, and what you do around this house means so much to you that in essence, I'm willing to give you a break tonight. Understand, the more you help out, the more strength she has for later. Uh, some of you are starving in church today because you don't help. <laughs> Lord, help us, Lord, help us. T turn to your name. Look, 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 look at the men in the room. Look at the men. Look at all the men. Ladies, look at the men. <laughs> Say, did you hear him? <laughs> huh? You've got to help. You've got to help. Those days of you just going to work and, and, and coming home, uh, those days for most people are over. There was a time when the man could go do and make all the money and the wife's the homemaker. That's great. That's a perfect world. We don't live that and we definitely don't live it in Bermuda. You've got to help. Yeah. And it's amazing when you help. Huh? You give her energy when you help. Lord, help us. Huh? When you cook that food, huh? Some of you, some of you can cook. Some of you can throw down. Many of you can't. It's all right. Once a week, cook the only dish you know how to make. I don't know. Toast some waffles. Make some eggs. <laughs> Do something. Understand with her, it's the thought that counts. Understand. It's, it's because of the fall that even one of us is subject to the other in the first place. But you need to also understand that for too long and in far too many ways, men have made the plight of women hard and difficult because they just won't help. She's not this person for you to just trample on and tell what to do and be this big dictator. No, 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 no. If that was the case, then you need to understand that you would be representing Christ and understand you are to love her as Christ loved the church. And if Christ was a dictator, we would all be dead already. But no, what does he do every single day? Whether you're nice or mean, whether you're faithful or unfaithful, what does he do every day? He makes the rain fall. Huh? He puts food on the table. Huh? He provides for all of your needs. Huh? And God is calling upon you uh, as the men of the house uh, to do as he has done uh, and love your wives. Uh, understand, understand. The Bible does not say to wives, love your husbands. <sighs> Which means romance begins with the man. 
Oh, I wish I had a witness in this place. It's your job to set the table. It's your job to light some candles. It's your job to get some roses and throw them up in the air and just let them later. It's your job to figure that stuff out. That's not her job. That's yours. She keeps setting the scene, hoping you'll catch a clue. <laughs> Understand the love of a woman's heart, that when she sees that you genuinely care for her, she will do anything for you. Break that trust and she wants nothing to do with you. Yeah, but it can be restored. And I challenge you today to be servant leaders in your house. Yeah. In other words, do less talking and more helping. That's all right. That's all right. I'm, I'm going to move on in the text. I'm offending, I'm offending some people. Uh, then, then said Boaz unto his servant, who said, whose damsel is this? And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabitish damsel that came with Naomi out of the country of Moab. You know what the Bible says? Okay? In other words, everybody in town knew that Naomi brought back an alien, a heathen woman with her that was once, if you would, the wife of her son. Here's the thing. We get to our text that in essence, she didn't just start gleaning. She's been gleaning all day. She's not a lazy woman. She knows how to conserve. She doesn't waste her husband's money. Oh, Jesus. Man. I figured it would get so quiet in church. She doesn't waste her husband's money. Lord help us. I know Elder Birch, he, he preached a good, a good message during uh, uh, his, 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 his opening up, if you would, to the prayer. I need to understand that Amazon should not deliver to your house every day. Some of you have three, four, five, six packages dropping off every day. Some of you can't wait to get home from work because Amazon's delivering. Matter of fact, some of you see Amazon, if you would, when they show up to your house, because you see them on your ring camera. <laughs> Some of you leave home lunch. You leave, you leave to go home to lunch just to see your packages. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I need you to understand uh, the, the, the flip side is also the same. Just like he needs to be a servant leader, you need to protect all the hard working money that he is making, or you will drive him to an early grave. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Be quiet again. Let's, you know, it's, it's funny. It's funny. It's, it's funny. When, he, when these moments happen in church, it reminds me of my days on White's Island when Boulevard would come. Boulevard would come, brother. Right? Boulevard would come to train for the weekend. And, you know, most of those guys at that time, a lot of them were Rastafarians. You know what I'm saying? And so, in essence, they'll be sitting around the dinner table waiting for dinner to be ready. All of them stacked around the table, bunch of them, long banquet table. They're all stacked around. And at some point, the guy at the head in charge, he would say, let's listen to the silence. <laughs> you could hear a pin drop. And then he'd go to all that stuff, yeah, Rastafari, all this kind of stuff they'll say. But here's the thing. Whenever you say something in church that the saints don't want to hear, it's just like that Rastafarian that said, let's listen to the silence. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, is that as a preacher, you got to become comfortable with silence. <laughs> silence means you're thinking. <laughs> And I need you to think, because at the end of the day, this is a very important moment that's happening here in Scripture. Understand this. She says, in essence, let me clean. Now, I need you to understand this. I need you guys to grasp this concept. That in essence, Boaz easily identifies a hard-working, listen to me, he's very able to easily identify a hard-working heathen woman because his mama was one. Oh, Jesus. Come on now. Turn with me if you would. Let's go to, I think it's Matthew chapter 1 and verse 4. Come on, let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 4. Come on, get that up on the screen for me quickly. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 4. I want us to read this text together. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 4. Come on now. I don't see it up on the screen yet. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 4. I guess they're still looking for it up top. All right, all right, all right. 
Uh, something's, act, something's playing at the TV. Oh, it's behind me. Fine. Matthew. No, that's not it. Matthew. No, I want to start at four. I want to start at four. Matthew chapter one and verse four. Come on. Let's read that together. I don't see it on the screen. Let's read it together. And Aram beget what? Aminadab. And Aminadab beget Naasin. And Naasin beget Salmon. Hold on now. Hold on. Beget Salmon. It's up to now. Come on now. Now let's lead into verse 5. Let's lead into verse 5. Let's see what the Bible says. Verse 5. Take me there. Verse 5. What does it say? I don't, I don't see it. Verse 5. Let's read verse 5 together. And Salmon beget who? Of who? Hold on a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Boaz's daddy was a Christian. Lord help us. He was a good Israelite. But Boaz's mama is Rahab, who used to run the brothel, who ran the place for prostitutes and harlots, the one who threw out the scarlet cord. Hold on a second now. No, 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 no. Some of you thought perhaps she just stayed unconverted. But the text says that the woman of the streets got married. She married Salmon. And hold on now. She gets included in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Jesus' great, great, great grandmother is Rahab. Huh? It's Rahab. Now hold on a second now. No, <laughs> in order to run the brothel, you got to be a hard-working woman. Lord Jesus, you got to show up early every day. Huh? Got to leave late at night. Trust me, uh, Boaz knows a hard-working, converted woman. Yeah. Woo! Because his mama changed her ways. Her mo his mama married a Christian. Uh, his mama joined the church. Uh, his mother, who was so messed up before, when she saw, if you would, that the spies showed up, she actually lied to her own people to protect the spies of God. And all she asked uh, was that when you come, uh, if you'll just remember me, they said, hang a scarlet cord outside uh, and we'll know where you are. And when they entered there, understand uh, the instructions were very clear to Joshua and his crew. Make sure that you get Rahab out. Uh, that's my grandmother in there. You make sure you get her out safely. It's an amazing moment because it doesn't stop there. Verse 5, for some reason, won't come up on the screen. Here's the thing. And Salmon begat who? Boaz of who? Rahab. And Boaz begot who? Obed. Of who? Yeah. Two heathens in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Two hard-working heathen women in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Ah, uh, because it doesn't stop there, everybody. Because guess who Obed had? Jesse. And Jesse is the man who gave, if you would, if you would, and, and got with his wife and had David. I need you to understand that this was all God's working to make sure that a baby would be born in Bethlehem. Amen. It's an amazing moment because... The text goes on to say, and I'm almost done here. Here's what the text says. The Bible goes on, if you would, in Ruth uh, chapter 2. Ruth uh, chapter 2. It keeps showing me Ruth up there, but it's not actually, yeah, that, that screen is totally confused. Come on, let me go back to Ruth. Come on, you guys, I need you guys to figure it out. You're making the seniors feel like they are right, that we should abandon technology. And also, listen, 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 listen. <laughs> You even have no technology in the cave, Pastor. Uh, listen. <laughs> listen. Verse 8. Verse 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. Neither go from hence, but abide here first by my maidens. In other words, if you would, Boaz sees this woman working so hard. He says, you know what? I don't want you working in any other field but my field. Here's the thing, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go thou after them, that I have, that I not have charged a young man that they shall not touch thee. 
And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels and drink of that which the young man had drawn. Here's the thing. Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes, that thou didst, shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said to her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother, and the land of thy nativity, and art come if you would, unto a people which thou knowest not heretofore. In other words, I see my mama inside of you. Ah, oh, the same stuff she did. It's the same stuff I see in you. But notice here, this is the first instance of scripture that we actually find a person, if you would, instituting equal rights. In other words, he sends her out and he lets the guys know, don't touch her, don't molest her, don't rape her, keep your hands off of her. Not just that, where you drink, she drinks. Oh, Lord, help us. Where, he, where you eat, she eats. She is now one of the crew. Now, it's amazing because after all of this, she goes back. Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord. For thou hast comforted me, for thou hast spoken friendly to thine handmaid. Boaz said unto her, at meal time, come thou hither, and eat of the bread. This is how nice he's being to her. And when she was risen up to glean, Boaz, check this out, when, because she is working so hard, Boaz gave her assistance. Come on now, I need to help somebody here. He gave her assistance. Uh, he didn't let her grind every single day without help. He gave her assistance. Boaz commanded the young man saying, let her glean among the sheaves and reproach her not. In other words, she will no longer be on the corners. She's now going to be in the main harvest. Oh, Lord, help us. She will no longer be on the outskirts. She will now be, if you would, among the official crew that's gleaning in the main spot. And here's what the Bible says. Here's the thing. And when she was risen up to glean, he, this is what he told him in verse 16. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her. In other words, what he's saying is, don't just let her glean in the middle, but I want you guys to drop some grain on purpose so she can have an abundance to go home with. I need you to understand that the harder the woman in your house works, the more you should be given to her. I'm afraid. I'm not afraid. Which means, which means, when she's working that hard, you should be giving her Amazon gift cards. Oh, Lord Jesus, man. Lord, help us, man. Huh? You oughtn't to be so frustrated when the boxes showed up because you gave her intentionally the money to get the boxes. Yeah. You know she likes stuff. Huh? She sees it. She likes it. She thinks it's going to be so great for the house. I know. I know there's a pile of stuff that's just sitting up in the garage that only got used once. I know. Yes, it's sitting there. Every kind of machine you could imagine. It could make a waffle, you know what I'm saying? It could make two waffles at the same time. It can make pancakes. Come on now, it make french fries, and it make pizza, all kind of machines in the house. That's why ain't no room in the house. There's no room in the house for all the devices and stuff that's up in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And all of them have been used once. Oh, come on now. I'm trying to help somebody in here that in essence though, in essence, you need to understand uh, that in essence, she ought to be able to be, if you would, independent when she's doing her part. You ought not to be restricting her when she's laboring just as hard as you. It's all right. It's okay. That's all right. It's not a popular one. It's okay. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned, and it was about an ephah bond, and she took it up, went into the city, and gleaned, and brought back forth, and gave to her that she reserved after she was sufficed. And her mother-in-law, verse 19, that's what I want to get to, and her mother-in-law said unto her, where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? In other words, you brought back a lot of stuff. Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law hmm, with whom she had wrought, and said, the man's name with whom I wrought today is Boaz. Naomi recognizes the name right away. 
And the Bible says, and Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, <laughs> one of our next kinsmen. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. One of our next kinsmen. Looks like they've stopped the screen on me again. Uh, if you would. And Ruth the Moabitess said, he said unto me also, thou shalt keep fast by my young man until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that thou go with the maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. Remember, Naomi was bitter. Ruth was positive. She was an alien, she was a foreigner that was determined to make something of herself in a foreign country. It's an amazing thing because we have many members here in Hamilton that are foreigners in a strange country. <laughs> yes, we do. And the truth of the matter is, is that they should never wonder if we're going to be kind to them. <laughs> there are many of them that can testify that oftentimes in the streets, and on the workplace, they are not treated with favor. They are not treated kindly. They are not treated fairly. They are not treated responsibly. Uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, why is it then that when they come to the house of God, they get the same treatment that they get on the streets? How is that case that in essence somehow, and I know we love this country, we love this rock, and we love it as beautiful as it is, we love it, but we ought to never love it more than we love people. We ought to love people first because the truth of the matter is as beautiful as this place is, we're told when the Lord shows up, the islands will be run out of their places. Uh, God's going to burn it all up. As beautiful as it is, uh, it will not compare. Hence, but here's what he does say. He does say uh, that the only way you get to go from here to up there is how you treat others. Yeah. Oh, hold on now. Hold on. And if you would, we find in Rahab a hard-working woman. In Ruth, we find a hard-working woman. And I need you to understand that in these last days, Jesus also has a woman, and she works really, really hard. Yes, she does. His woman, he calls the church, the church of the living God. And his church works really, really hard. If you would, come on, turn to me just one more text, if you would. Matthew chapter 25. I want to go to Matthew chapter 25. I want to go towards the end of Matthew Matthew chapter 25. Come on, open up your Bibles. Matthew to Matthew chapter 25. I don't see it up there yet, but Matthew the 25th chapter. Very popular, uh, if you would, chapter in the Bible. But I want to go there. Matthew chapter 25. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I want to start with verse 31. Come on, read it with me, if you would. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What does the next verse say? Come on, read it. Hungry, what? And you what? And you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and what? And you gave me drink. I was a what? a stranger and you took me in verse 34 come on now what does it say verse 36 sorry naked and ye what and you clothed me and you what you visited me i was in what prison and you came unto me come on next verse then shall the righteous answer him saying Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? And Jesus says, when, sorry, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Verse 39, or when saw we thee sick 
or in prison or came unto thee. And verse 40 says, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Verse 41, here's what it says. Then shall he say also to them that on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 42, for I was hungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. 43, come on now. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in naked, and ye clothed me not sick and in prison, and ye visited not. Verse 44, then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? And 45 says this, then shall the kingdom of heaven, no, that's not it, no, no, then shall he, what everybody? I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. Your salvation <laughs> is bent on whether or not you are working for Jesus in these last days. Jesus, if you would, the women in his ancestry <laughs> were some hard-working women. And if you're going to be his bride in these last days, you're going to have to learn how to work. <laughs> work <laughs> for the night is coming. <laughs> when no man can work, <laughs> you've got to work <laughs> and understand. The Bible says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I need you to understand uh, that not only must you work, but you must be patient while you work. Uh, you must work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, and you must tell everybody you meet uh, that Jesus saves. Uh, when they see that smile on your face, when they see that look in your eyes, uh, when they see that joy in the midst of the most expensive country on earth, on your face, uh, and they ask you, how how is it that you can still smile? How is it that you can be so happy uh, and you can look at them and let them know that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, uh, that where would I be uh, if it had not been for his grace uh, and his mercy uh, that follow me all the days of my life? If it had not been uh, that the Lord is my shepherd, uh, I shall not want. If it had not been uh, the fact that God God is my refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. If it had not been for Jesus picking me up and placing me in church, then I would be lost just like you. And I want to let you know that Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. God's looking for a hardworking woman in these last days. And as we go into next year, we got we to gotta plan some evangelism. We got to reap more souls. We got to fight because the day is coming real soon when no man can work. Oh, I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of God's hard-working church. I want to do my part to hasten the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The truth is, is that he will finish the work. The truth is, is that he could do it all by himself. But he enlists us in the army. So that in the process of doing these things, we will be saved ourselves. Notice that the just shall live by faith alone. But the righteous faith is judged by the works. <laughs> See, your works reveal who you have faith in. <laughs> yeah. And so what am I saying to you? I think some of this stuff is a little easy for you. Come in here, help with the feeding program, help give out different stuff. I want to talk to you about the most challenging part. And that's being kind and nice and respectful yeah. and loving and kind yeah. to the strangers that are in our midst. 
Every single foreigner that's in Hamilton ought to feel like family. Yes. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yes. They ought to feel like everybody in this house loves them. Huh? Yes. Come on now. Yes. I, I need us to understand. Uh, just, just because... Just because your family got here on the boat generations ago, Lord Jesus, doesn't mean you're better than the people that are just coming now. Oh, some of you want to get mad at your own ancestry. Lord Jesus. Some of you want to despise the very people from where you're from. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, uh, while you want to revere the people that could care nothing about you and want to keep you oppressed and downtrodden. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, I, I, I need to help somebody in here to understand today uh, that you need to learn how to recognize who the oppressor really is. Oh, Lord Jesus. It's okay. It's okay. I knew I would have quiet moments. And in the honor of Boulevard, let's listen to the silence. It's an amazing thing. But the reason why God challenges you the most in the areas of your greatest difficulty is because when we get to heaven, guess what? When we get to heaven, it just may shock some of you, but there are going to be people in heaven that are not from Bermuda. Yeah. There are going to be people from the Caribbean in heaven. Oh, Jesus. Jesus loves people from Bahamas, from Barbados, from Trinidad, from Jamaica, from St. Kitts and Nevis. Jesus loves all of them just as much as he loves you. And to mistreat one of them is to mistreat one of his children that he shed his blood for. Who are you? Who are you? To try and think for some reason you can mistreat somebody because they have an accent, because they talk a little different. Huh? While, while, while if you run into somebody that's from European descent, you want to sing, God save our gracious king. I want to let you know there's only one king. It's the king of kings and lord of lords. And like it or not, you can act the fool all you want. When the day of judgment comes, you will have to answer to him. And he says, he's putting the sheep on the right and he's putting the goats on the left. And the question today is, are you a sheep? Are you a goat? Now, I don't want you to take this symbolically, okay? I don't want to take it symbolically, Sister Graham. I don't want next week's Sabbath, everybody sitting on my right, Sister Graham. I, don't, I, don't want to... <laughs> I need you to understand. This is the judgment seat in heaven. And God loves all of us. And when he died, he died for all of us. How do you know? How do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God died for everybody? Not just that he said, oh, of course he said, but on top of that, no one on earth or, or who has ever lived on earth has ever died the second death. No one. There will be a first resurrection and there will be a second resurrection. The only reason anyone will be able to get up in either resurrection is because Jesus already died the second death. Because if you died for your sins, you can't get up. Listen to me. I'm going to close with this. I need you to understand this. Oh, don't miss this. I need you to understand that in the most holy place, there's the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that Ark is what's called the mercy seat. Okay? It's where you sprinkle the blood on, right? You know, if you would, for the remission of your sins. But there's a seat there. Now, inside the Ark 
are the Ten Commandments. Which means, listen to me, God places that top on top of the ark as a barrier to keep you from getting to the Ten Commandments. Because if you get to the Ten Commandments and have to pay for your own sins, then there is no coming back. So he puts a mercy seat to prevent you from getting there, hoping that you will accept the blood that he shed for you that's on the mercy seat so you don't have to die for your sins. No matter what you've done, he already died for it. No matter how bad you are, he already died for you. Everything you have ever done, he has already paid for. Stop looking for what you already have <laughs> and surrender your life to Jesus amen. today. Who says amen to God's word? Hey, listen, man, listen, listen. Today, perhaps your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Just want to offer, we always want to offer, there's always somebody here that may be, wants to serve Jesus, that wants to be baptized, wants to be in the next baptism, and we never want to close that door because some people just leave the house because they want to be saved. If that's you, you want to be in the next baptism, you want to join this community of faith, you want to be a part of God's hard-working church. This hard-working woman, I just want to invite you to raise your hand wherever you are. You want to be in the next baptism. God bless you in the back. Her hands up already. Is there somebody else? Is there somebody else that would like to raise? God bless you. I see you, Laura. I got the children always lead. Hey, I see you. I see two more in the balcony. Our children always lead the way. Lead the way. I know that's the first time. Yeah, okay, I see you. I see you. That's the first time. Oh, I see two. I see three up there. That's young. That's young Rebain up there. I don't think I've ever seen him come down. Maybe he'll come next week. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen him raise his hand before. I see you, man. I see you, Ashton. But no, there's no question about it. That the children have to show us what that simple love is all about and that simple trust. See, many of you don't get up out your seats because you're worried about what other people think. Children could care less. <laughs> huh? They come marching down here because they understand the simplicity of the gospel. And for us to be saved, the Bible lets us know we got to become just like those children in order for us to be an experienced salvation. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the sure foundation. Father, may we join hands together, unified, focused, and determined as we enter into this new year which is soon to be upon us that we as the community of faith will be one hard working woman doing everything we can to hasten your soon return and to cooperate with heaven in finishing the work this is our prayer we pray today in Jesus name let the redeemed of the Lord say amen, amen. come on somebody say amen again Okay, now if you let the ladies could remind the men one more time, just say help, ladies. <laughs> okay, they're afraid to say help. What are you doing to these ladies? Come on, ladies, say help. <laughs> Lord, help us. They're afraid to say help, man. They're afraid to say help. God bless you guys as we continue today to worship him in spirit uh, and in truth. Let's stand for our closing hymn, Jesus is all the world to me. We'll sing the first and the last stanza.
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, which came through your man servant today, clearly and profoundly. We thank you, Lord, for the hard working women of your church. Pray that you will bless them with strength and wisdom that they will continue to serve you. Lord, we pray as one well say, thank you, Lord, for hard working wives. Help us, Lord, to be more uh, helpful unto them, that they will continue to be loving and we will continue to love them as husbands, as you have loved your church and gave your dear son Jesus Christ as an atoning offering for the sins, for our sins. We ask, Lord, that your blessing be with us as we depart from this place. May we continue, Lord, to serve and to work in unity, Lord, to fulfill the work, the service that you have given us to do so that your coming will be hastened. This we ask in Jesus' most precious and holy name. Amen. You go. 